All right, I do believe we are live. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Break the Rules live stream. I am your humble host, Lev Polyakov at LevPo on Twitter. And we are here today with Aiden Paladin returning back with us and the great CIA asset, as is written here, <laughs> uh, Dylan Burns. Dylan Burns, you are heroic. The fact that you were able to go into Ukraine, report on what's going on right now, also doing live streams before, like the hippy dippy uh, live stream, and now you've been talking about the uh, hippies from the left who are all uh, peaceniks about the Ukraine situation. So we are going to get into a lot of this right now. We are going to be talking about whether uh, the United States and the West in general should be arming Ukraine and what are going to be the repercussions of either we keep arming Ukraine or we do not arm Ukraine. And uh, yeah, so uh, let's go to Aiden first. Aiden, you are a uh, social science thoth. I want to say thoth, you know, the Egyptian god of wisdom. I right, think right. I think way. it's actually pronounced toth, but I've been referred to, I've been told that by someone who calls themselves thoth. So I don't know if he's correct. Um, but yeah, yeah social so, science thoth. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, Aiden, uh, please give us uh, your view, being a libertarian and what's going on. And also for sure. all the new people, be sure to smash that like button, smash that subscribe button. You guys know the drill already. There's no need for me to say any more. Anyway, go for it, Aiden. Okay, so first I want to say uh, what you've done, I didn't know you were in Ukraine right now, Dylan, but uh, your entire work has is incredibly brave and courageous. And I, I do want to thank you for that because there's Thanks. pretty much nobody is doing or is willing to do what you have done. And I think that's that's extremely important, um, the work that you're doing. But my contentions uh, and issues concerning the West funding and arming Ukraine don't come out of some kind of dedication to Russia and allegiance to Putin or anything like that in any way, but instead because I fundamentally oppose the United States involvement in any foreign conflicts, financially or otherwise. This is a particular issue as it involves Ukraine, given the deep ties of the Biden family with the nation, regardless of the truth behind the claims that Biden himself personally ordered the firing of prosecutor Victor Shokin for his investigation into Ukrainian energy firm Burisma, to which his son Hunter and Hunter's friend Archer were elected to the board, all of which Joe bragged about publicly, nor the infamous phone call between Deputy Sep Secretary of State uh, in the Obama administration, Victoria Nuland, with Jeffrey Piat concerning their preference for the election of Arseny Yatsenyuk to the position of Ukrainian PM, nor the reports of Dr. Olga um, Bogomolets, excuse me, I always pronounce her last name wrong, Bogomolets, who claimed that the bullets used by the snipers to kill protesters in the Euromaidan had the same handwriting, that's her terminology, um, as NATO munitions concerning only the current state of the United States' involvement in Ukraine. It has cost the U.S. taxpayers $75 billion as to date. <clears throat> for conflict in which the United States is ostensibly not involved. The history between Ukraine and Russia is ancient, and the very idea of Ukraine as a nation is in and of itself in its infancy. The country known as Ukraine today contains regions which have high diasporas of ethnic Russians, such as Crimea and Donbass, but also regions such as Bessarabia, Northern Brokovnia, Herza, Krasi, Carpathia, and Ruthenia, which have all historically been parts of Moldova, Romania, Poland, and Czechoslovakia. And its borders were defined under the Soviet regime, under. Um, under the auspices of the Ukrainian SFSR, the historical capital of Russia under the Kievan Rus, as the name implies, was Kiev or Kiev. I, I never know how, what the correct pronunciation is on that, so you would know better to correct me on my pronunciation. While Ukrainians have a unique language and culture from Russians, they share history between the two nations, and that shared history is undeniable and truly ancient, and their current conflict, while lamentable in the softest of terms, is regardless not the concern of a third-party nation such as the United States. It is not the role of a foreign power to weigh in financially or otherwise on the conflicts of other sovereign states, no matter how disgusting or horrifying the realities of war may offend us. If we, as a financially and militaristically powerful nation, if not the most powerful nation on earth, are to elect ourselves to serve as some kind of world police, then under what auspices can we judge Russia for doing similarly so? Not a single nation should dictate the borders, actions, or even conflicts of other nations. And thus, while my heart bleeds for the innocent people whose lives have been destroyed, ended, or irreparably disturbed and disrupted by this war, I cannot just I cannot justify ethically the use of American taxpayer funds to support either side. It is simply not our business, and the fact that it is being treated as such is a vestigial but quickly withering manifestation of American imperialism. All right, Dylan, uh, go for Sorry, it. Sorry, it's my opening statement. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a very debatey uh, thing, which I think is good. I think it's a change because usually people just like go whole hog sometimes. So, uh, Dylan. I only wrote uh, the opening. I have nothing else. So that's it. <laughs> your, uh, your professional response. Uh, go for it. 
Uh, sure. So I didn't really write an opening. I didn't know there was going to be a, like, a original. Crazy. I didn't, I didn't I can, know either, but yeah. I, I can um <laughs> I can just go through what I like to do usually when I talk about the conflict is just start with the modern history of the conflict. Because I think that a lot of people don't know much about Euromaidan. A lot of people just started kind of yep. following the conflict in 2022. But in 2013, late 2013, early 2014, a protest movement started on the street in response to Viktor Yanukovych, who was the democratically elected uh, president of the Ukrainian government. And at the time, the protest movement started because in the middle of the night, he decided he was going to pull out of the association agreement. The association agreement was an agreement that was being negotiated between the Ukrainian government and the EU that would have negotiated visa-free travel, would have negotiated easier trade between Ukraine and the European Union, which would have opened Ukraine up to a lot more markets. That would have been beneficial for most Ukrainians. According to the polling data at the time, most Ukrainians favored these closer ties to the European Union. In fact, Yanukovych promised on the campaign trail that he would enter the association agreement because that it was popular at the time. But mm -hmm. due to pressure from the Russian government and them trying to use economic coercion, which included the stopping of trade across the border, uh, this made Yanukovych reverse course because of Russia's deep ties with Ukraine and because of his deep ties with Russia uh, personally and politically. Uh, this created a response from people who thought that he had back, you know, he had backstabbed the people make, making this promise. And that response was brutally cracked down upon. Yanukovych hired armed gangs called uh, the Tutushki, which would be the equivalent of hiring the Bloods and the Crips to go and try to disperse protests and provoke protesters, sent in the special services, the Burkut, which is a whole long history of racketeering, corruption and police abuse. They tied uh, nails and bolts to around flashbangs and threw them into the crowd. They went and brutalized protesters with metal poles instead of normal police batons. And eventually this would uh, culminate in the massacre of the Heavenly Hundred. Now, I heard some talk about the sniper attacks, and I know that there have been some um, independent reporters who have said something different to what all the uh, investigations found, which was that the bullet shells were actually in line with police weapons and that the bullets did match that. And I know there is some dissenters, but the overwhelming evidence seems to point towards the brutalizing and murdering protesters on the ground. I don't really respect the people who have come with a with an alternate idea because none of them have yet to put those alternate ideas under uh, review, under review not only from investigators who were there at the time, but also just review of other academics. And it's just their own report. That it, they it's just Olga Boga who said review. that. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And so I do want to just clarify that because you know that's something that I know a lot of mm -hmm. Ukrainians are uh, really angry about: the Heavenly Hundred being murdered. After the Heavenly Hundred were murdered, the protests spiraled out even more. The protesters got violent in response. A lot of civil defense groups formed on the ground. A lot of the groups that would become kind of known afterwards, like Right Sector and Azov started to form or these coalitions started to form at the time. But it wasn't just them. There were anarchist coalitions as well. There were worker coalitions as well, or unions and other groups that formed to fight back against the government. And after this started to break down, uh, Yanukovych decided he would try to pass a law to ban protesting instead of trying to reverse course after some offers to the protesters. And that seemed to be one of the final straws that made the protest spiral so out of control that eventually he fled the country. Then at that point, the Russians took the opportunity to try to secure the security interests in Crimea, invaded in order to try to protect their port. Now, I do want to emphasize that when they took over Crimea, this port, we didn't know for sure if the lease on it was gonna be extended for the Russians or not gonna be extended for the Russians. It was all still in the air, but- to they be clear, just, uh, just what you're talking about, to, to I don't invert. want to interrupt you, but just to, mm -hmm. to be clear about, at the time, the Russians were leasing the port. Yes, they so were they, leasing the port. Okay. They were leasing Sevastopol, and they were, cons well, this is what they said. There was a concern <laughs> that possibly that lease could be ended. Now, mm -hmm. the government did not say they were going to end the lease, and the negotiations were still ongoing about the renewal of the lease, but they took the opportunity to invade by international law, which was illegally, uh, illegally under international law and take over Crimea. Now there's a conversation about ethnic ties that we can get into later, but that's the basic start to the original parts of the conflict, right? Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of talks about, for example, the Victor Newland phone call, which I've listened to time and time again. And I don't really think that there's anything in that phone call that makes me think that there was American meddling that chose the next leadership. When they were talking about Petro Poroshenko, he was one of very few options of who was going to be the next leader. It would be the equivalent of Emmanuel Macron looking at the current American electorate, the current American election, saying Trump and Biden. Yeah, Trump would be the uh, Biden would be the guy that we like. That doesn't mean the French came in and chose Biden. That doesn't mean that the French came in and manipulated the elections and results. It's that the French know that if they had Biden, they would probably have a stronger Euro-Atlantic uh, trade relationship, a stronger Euro-Atlantic, you know, 
matchup. And so that's the people that they preferred. There's been no evidence that Victoria Nuland meddled in the elections or changed it. In fact, something I want to say about that phone call is in that phone call, Victoria Nuland says the protesters should take the deal offered mm -hmm. by the Yanukovych regime. But then the protesters don't do what Victoria Nuland wants and do the exact opposite and don't accept the deal. So if anything, I think that shows that the American government did not have a hold on the situation. They did not control what the protesters were doing. And the protesters were acting independently of American interests. Um, that's the, the bare bones of the conflict. The Russians would then move in to flood weapons into eastern Ukraine, which has been admitted to by not only multiple Russian mm -hmm. government officials and soldiers after the words, even though at the time they denied it, but they would even put soldiers in there, which would then later get captured the whole time they were denying they were doing it. And this would eventually uh, freeze over after Minsk 1 and 2, and it would be a generally frozen conflict for about eight years. Uh, frozen, as frozen as, you know, 20 to 50 people dying every year from artillery shell and camping, but frozen, frozen relative to the hot war we see today. And so we came to 2022 when the Russians started the training operations, the training exercises before eventually they invaded the country with a goal of marching on the capital, disarming the government, prob most likely replacing the, the regime, quote unquote, the government in Kiev, they call it the regime, and uh, instituting their either control of Donetsk and Luhansk and the complete change of the government and the state of affairs in Ukraine by force. That is, I would say, the modern history breakdown. The only reason I'm starting with that is because a lot of people only know 2022 invasion and that's it. And so I wanted no, and to I, lay that I, out at the start. I think your your uh, recollection, your your description of that is completely accurate and I agree with it. So we're on the same page, cool. <laughs> so uh, awesome. before, I just, before we- I wanted uh, to make sure that we yeah. started there. Now, mm. you had some concerns. Do you want to start with uh, addressing any of those concerns? Um, any concerns mm. specifically? Well, like because Victoria Newland, for about, example. Um, like, I want to make sure that what Dylan, <clears throat> what you said about Victoria Newland, Aiden, is this something that you would agree with? Do you have any counters to what Dylan uh, said as far as how influential America was? I, I, I agree with your general dealing with your with what you said there about like, well, it's just to talk about oh, who would we prefer. The reason why I think it's not that quite that simple is because we're not talking about just anybody having this conversation right we're talking about victoria newland who is deputy secretary of state and in terms of who did end up getting elected was arsene yatsenyuk it, which was what they said they wanted they said we want yachts we don't want oleti hanibuk who did have this connection to the right sector and to azov um they didn't want him and I think the reason why they, they kind of elaborated that they didn't want him is they didn't think they could control him but he is like the Nazi guy right um but Arseny Optinuk is who they wanted, and that's who was elected. So regardless of the actual truth, because it's impossible for us to actually know this, to, to really parse it, it looks very suspicious. When the Deputy Secretary of State is making a phone call saying, this is who we want to be in power, when we are at, during a period of time when the previous regime is being ousted uh, in terms of uh, Poroshenko, it looks suspicious. And I think there's no denying that. Whether or not it's true, I don't know. I think it's undeniable. It looks suspicious. So I, I just would want to ask then, because I would assume that mm -hmm. any time there's an election in the United States, there is a conversation in every country in the world, because America's the most powerful country in the world. And what happens here affects the whole world, whether it be mm -hmm. with oil prices, the world reserve currency, anything. It could be, I mean, if the American president goes in and said, I'm just going to print every dollar endlessly, like that could crash the world economy, right? Mm -hmm. So obviously every country would have some conversation was like, if this guy gets elected, we need to have a plan to engage with him. If this guy gets elected, we need to have a plan to engage with him. And I assume that conversation's happening in France, Germany, and all over the world in relation to the Biden and, and Trump election. So if we found out that there was a conversation in, say, Germany between Olaf Schultz and one of his ministers, like, yeah, Biden would be the guy we would want. And then Biden would go on to win. Would that mean and you would be, we would now be able to say that, hey, that's pretty suspicious. I think the Germans might have, you know, maybe gotten there and done something. I think the problem is that it's not the only isolated piece of evidence. Right. And we know this fully well. We know for a fact that Joe Biden, uh, son of a bitch, the prosecutor got fired. He had he had Victor Shokin fired for investigating Burisma. He was vice president we at the time. We don't know that. He says what he said. He did not say that we, he got Victor Shokin fired for investigating Burisma. He has said on multiple occasions, whether it be at the Council for Relations immediately afterwards when he did it or uh, at many of the other speaking events, that he got him shot, fired because he was extremely corrupt, which he was. We went uh, it, was corrupt. Only, it wasn't only Biden that wanted him fired. It was the EU. It was uh, multiple other European powers like Germany, France. It was most Ukrainians that wanted him fired. It was 
It was everybody but Shokin who wanted Shokin gone, basically. Yeah, obviously, but <laughs> he didn't want to fire himself. However, again, doesn't that look a little suspect? When his son, and one of the things that, that Shokin was allegedly investigating was his son and Hunter uh, Hunter and um, Archer, uh, Devin Archer, uh, their involvement on the board of Burisma, which is this Ukrainian energy company, neither of which, either one of them, were in any way qualified to serve on and yet they were serving on it and being paid hundreds of well it was like a hundred thousand dollars a year a year i believe and one of the things from the internally leaked emails was that he was there to sell his father's influence from the internally leaked emails now if you don't believe the um well, i know I, I can believe a hundred percent from my time in ukraine that there were mm -hmm. ukrainian oligarchs who thought if we hired the son of some president or some higher profile official mm -hmm. we could use that to benefit ourselves i sure. believe them 100 percent I also believe that Hunter Biden is a crack addicted mess, um, and he was at least at the time. Now he's gotten his act. I hope he's gotten his act. Well, they found that little piece of uh, cocaine in the White House uh, not too long True, ago. True, not too but... long ago. Yeah. Sorry, I, I, you know, I was having a nice time. You know, it was it was CIA fun yeah. night. I'm sorry, whatever. But um, if if we're if we're buying this, we have to immediately accept that this was Joe Biden, the in the Obama administration, allowing mm -hmm. him to go out of his way for his personal corruption, which just so happened to also align with what most of Europe wanted, what most Ukrainians wanted, with what the American government wanted, with what the Obama administration wanted, with what most anti-corruption activists wanted, what most of Ukrainian civil society wanted. This wasn't just like one, if it was Joe Biden going out of his way to do something that most of Europe didn't want, it was just like, wait, why is the president coming out of nowhere to get the prosecutor of Ukraine fired? At the time, they were reporting it, and this is this was true, that, oh, it's good that he's fired because he was unbelievably corrupt. Yeah, That's he, how he was. media covered it. That's how most anti-corruption activists covered mm -hmm. it. And so if we're going to accept this, we have to just accept this based purely upon suspicion and based purely upon the idea that Hunter Biden was able to hook Joe Biden into this corruption scheme, which we have yet to find any strong evidence of. Uh, we got the big guy in the email, whatever. Uh, yeah, that means. I'm, I'm that saying is the it's closest a, we've gotten, it's and a, that's it's not a, it's decisive enough no. for me to say that what, the Obama administration let him go out of out of the Obama administration's policy way in the realm of foreign policy for a few hundred thousand dollars for hmm. his son. I think it's a lot easier for me to believe that Hunter Biden, a crack addicted mess, wanted more crack, and so he took up any job he could. And these corrupt politicians here, well, not corrupt politicians, but oligarchs, saw this guy was the son of the vice president, was like, let's give him money. Hunter Biden thought, crack, 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 yeah. crack, crack. No, I, I, and they I took the it. money. Can we and admit then once they interest. started interacting with them, yeah. they realized this isn't going to go anywhere. And eventually, he's no longer on the board of Burisma. Same thing with the Chinese businessmen. They were giving him True. diamonds. They were giving him gifts. And then he was banging these like like uh, teachers on the desk of his office, working with these Chinese businessmen. Yeah, he's, he's a mess. But what happens? He, it we falls apart. That. He delivers on nothing that he promised to them because he can't deliver on anything. He just wanted money for drugs, and he uh, was a mess. He, he did facilitate several meetings um, with at least one that I'm 100 percent sure about from the Latinos. Go? Do we I know? Don't, no, we don't That's, know how they went. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. Well, we, we I just want to just quickly say go ahead, go because ahead. when we say facilitate meetings, do we mean they sit down and like let's talk all the shady business or Who have knows? a nice day? Which Who knows? We know for a fact yeah. that he facilitated at least one meeting. Hmm. With the, the head of Burisma, though. And and here's the thing. Like, yeah, we're not going to know the intricate details of this because we can't know them, as with so many of these things that I was talking about earlier. However, well, they, they are launching an inquiry into this, aren't they? You think that's going to go anywhere? Under the Biden administration? You think Under, President Joe I Biden's going to allow himself Republican to be investigated? House, they launched the inquiry. That's true. That's true. They, I think he they're is, appointing like special prosecutors for Hunter Biden. He is being impeached. That's true. We'll see if it goes anywhere. Yeah. I don't think it will. But that's just my nihilism. Well, uh, uh, let's, however, uh, yes. Uh, just, to, just to finish yes. my, my thought here. Mm -hmm. We don't know the realities of any of this. We don't know the specifics of any of this. However, I think that as external observers, we can note that that looks suspicious and is certainly a conflict of interest for the vice president's son to be serving on this Ukrainian uh, energy company for which he has no qualifications.
Well, let's uh, take a step back for a moment and look at the bigger picture. To me, this Hunter Biden thing right now is a ant in comparison to the elephant mm. that is Russia going into one territory with the potential to go into another one. And this is something that's been going on for a very long time. It happened in New Transnistria in Moldova. It happened with Southern Ossetia in Georgia. So the pattern that I'm observing... I yeah, is that, earlier, yeah, no, I think you're, I think you're good. <laughs> I think you're good. So the pattern that I'm noticing is that Russia keeps going going wherever it is not stopped. And if you don't stop Russia, then Russia is just going to keep going. And mm. even though there's a lot of, you know, horrible, horrible things that Russia has been doing to the Ukrainian people right now, as Dylan yourself, you've observed, the problem, I think, with a lot of the appeals to emotion that politicians who are pro-Ukraine bring up, for instance, is that a lot of the Americans will counter saying, well, that's horrible, there's a lot of horrible things happening in the world, but at the same time, we are not in a good state here in America with migration, with crime rates, with the economy, and they're gonna say, you know what, why don't we go back to what I think Aiden's position here is, go back to the founding fathers who wanted Europe to uh, F off and just have us do our own thing, but then to me, the question's always, well, what are going to be the consequences of doing that? So Dylan, uh, I'm curious if you would want to look into that a bit and let me know what you think. I, I do want to reject the one premise. The idea that the founding fathers was like, America's just going to kind of do its own thing. Even George Washington, when he was laying out the foundation of what is now the usually the basis of a lot of American isolationism, um, he was saying at the time that we need to hold this inward looking position where we're not getting involved in the French Revolution. We're not getting involved in these other affairs until we get our own affairs in order because we have farmer rebellions. We have all these other issues that are tearing the nation at its strength to the point where it could quite literally cease to exist. We're not talking about like debating trans bathrooms here. We're talking about farmers with guns taking government storehouses, not, you know, a, guy, a few guys on a bunch of beer lights charging the Capitol think they're doing a revolution, right? We're talking a, a lot more mass violent action gets a lot more people killed. Um, but immediately afterwards, we were doing interventions in the upper echelon, uh, the upper parts of Africa against the Barbary yes. pirates in order to secure international It's all wrong, trade. in my opinion. In my opinion, that was always wrong. I, that, that's, okay. that's my position. But go ahead, go ahead. Well, I'm, just, I'm just rejecting the premise that the founding yes. fathers were these bastions of like <laughs> anti-interventionism or libertarian policies on foreign policy because some were but the majority were not I, I don't think i said that though no you didn't, you didn't say that i'd say that you okay i was yeah. responding okay. to yes the, to the host. Yeah, that's the that's right, the right, right, idea yeah. that I find a lot of libertarians Rickle, Rickle. have in general, where they think about the founding founding fathers, and that's their opinion on America yeah. just being this completely isolationist place. And look, afterwards, when we look at World War II, you know, right before uh, America entered into the war, there was such a concentration of people who were completely against it, who were you know peaceniks of their day, and a lot of them also had Russian Al agents Al that Alexander were. Alexander the... Hamilton was also a monarchist, so it's like uh, sure. totally basing everything that you think on the the. Yeah beliefs or statements of the founders, I think is a little yeah. bit erroneous. No, no but, 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 but not more, that helpful. But more to the idea that this uh, mm -hmm. emphasis on isolationism is something that repeats itself in the history of the United States. Sure. And what I find that's happening today, I know what you think, Dylan, as well, but what I find happens today is that there is influence from abroad on having a lot of these peace Nick ideas, especially like you were talking about the left code pink recently. They were going into Bernie Sanders' office and uh, talking about how he's uh, rejecting peace and all that and how we shouldn't uh, help Ukraine. And this is something that I find has occurred uh, pretty often when it comes to making sure that America does not aid in a war effort by the uh, you know by the enemy here in that case it was back when russia and germany were united in a, a temporary friendship so we had a lot of these kgb well and nkvd agents coming into the united states to influence uh, same thing with german agents so today i'm not sure what the lay of the land is there as far as who's influencing what but my more important <coughs> point here is what argument besides anything having to do with morality can we give to the peaceniks, to people who do not want uh, there to be conflict, uh, where it is going to be in the United States' best interest to intervene in this, um, in this uh, war that's going on, where if they didn't intervene, A, B, C is going to happen not even to Ukraine, not even to Europe, but to the United States. 
because again, I think people are very selfish and they're going to think about America first. We want to make sure that everything's going to be good with America. So, uh, Dylan, uh, let me know what you think. And then Aiden, I would love for you to respond. Yeah. Um, a few things. When it, when it comes to foreign influence, I think that a lot of these people would believe this, whether or not the Russians want them to believe it or not. There has always been a certain amount of Americans in any foreign conflict who just think that we need to keep care of, we need to take care of our own. This isn't our problem or some variation of that. Now, it is true that the Russians have tried to increase that amount, whether you can look at books taught in the Russian Naval Academy and the Russian Military Academy, and they'll say like the foundation of geop geopolitics, which is taught to the officer corps. Um, it says in there that we need to create as much discontent in the United States as physically possible in order to try to cause tension between the races, cause tension between different mm -hmm. radical groups in order to try to tear at the fabrics of society because they understand that russia is not is it be current land. is it current russian uh politic though or is that oh, soviet yeah. that that is taught that is they're taught still the doing that. they're military. still the soviet oh, they're still wow. the kgb so well, that's a modern that was that was introduced after the yeah. soviet union collapse mm. oh my god so that is okay. like an old because I, I thought that was, that was no but soviet they were doing stuff. it but just to be clear they were doing it back in the 70s too for example that famous yeah. black activist who is still a university professor dylan please help me out here what's her name Name, the uh, radical uh, black uh, a lot of radical communist. Uh, yeah, she's, a lot of still of radical <laughs> she's still a professor today. Anyway, yeah. I'm going to look up her name. But anyway, she was a frequent guest of honor in the USSR, you know, back in my parents' day there. She frequently went there. She went to communist Poland. She went all over the place in the USSR. And the motive behind this whole thing was to get a lot of people in black America to be very angry about the United States. And like you were saying, Dylan, to uh, inflame this racial conflict that was already going on during that time. So that's why I think. I don't today, know if you yeah. guys saw, but remember that Black Hammer movement, like the uh, the guy who yes, said, oh, yes, Uru, the black, you remember that guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They all uh, got busted for commune. ties yeah. to the Russian government. Mm. Right. It was very strange. Uh, it was a very strange interaction. Well, I, I don't think that's totally well, new. Just, I don't think that's post-Soviet. I think that's. I don't think well, that's post-Soviet. Yeah. But I just wanted. I just wanted to quickly to, to wrap that point up. Mm. Sure, the main sorry. thing that disturbs me, though, is how quickly people took up Russian narratives once the war, like once mm -hmm. the shock of the war set off. Because at the beginning, a lot of people were embarrassed because they were saying it's impossible. War was going to happen. There's no way an invasion was oh. going to happen. And in that first month, all yeah. those people just kind of shut down and they were quiet and they didn't really know what to do because everything they had built their arguments upon had just fallen apart yeah there but was one... someone who, who said that like just like the week before some public figure who said that russia's never going to invade ukraine than they did yeah yeah um, there was a lot of them uh, it was i know uh jackson yeah. hinkle caleb, caleb maupin hasanabi famous switch streamer a oh, bunch of that's the one i that's a... the one i was thinking of that has said yeah. that a bunch yeah. of people did that and i think at first they were too embarrassed but as time went on and as the war went on, they started to come back out of the cracks and start pushing these narratives. I think the scariest thing is when I see Congress people pushing it. Recently, Marjorie Taylor Greene was doing an interview for some, I think it was either News Nation or OAN, and she was talking about how the Ukrainian state is kidnapping children, harvesting their organs to try to pay for the Ukrainian war effort. Um, and that is straight from, I mean, that sounds like something straight out of the Elders of Zion, to be quite blunt. Yeah, yeah that like that's out of all yeah <laughs> rt's mouth that is something that their state duma uh, representatives are just saying mm. with no evidence and she's regurgitating uh, i see commentators like jimmy Dore recently yeah. publishing pieces talking about mass surrendering of ukrainian troops i'll click one or two links what do i find out published by russia today that's the only yeah, proof well, of this yeah. ever existing and, and don't don't forget scott that ritter that's I, 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 got yeah. rid of the pedophile but like yeah. that yeah. that's the stuff that bothers me the most is because I want more than anything an honest conversation where we're yeah. working off of the I same agree. basis of truth. And there's so many different state interests trying to get involved in the conversation to pull people left and right. And so I would one of the big <laughs> pieces of advice I would offer people is, number one, don't take any government, whether it's the Ukrainian government or the Russian government, at their word when they publish reports. Absolutely. Look at independent reports on the ground. Check different NGOs that are going to be checking stuff and, and doing their own reviews with their own agents on the ground. That's not to say if they ever publish anything completely discredited. If they have enough evidence, then they have enough evidence. The Ukrainian government, for example, a lot of people just disregarded the Ukrainian government's reports about Bucha when it first happened. But right. when the evidence was fully piled up and we had video proof of Russian soldiers shooting people in the back oh. of the head and the mass graves being filled, then, then we could t take their accounts as credible because they had enough evidence to back it up. And if something like that ever happened on the Russian side, then we could believe that as well. It's just hard to imagine because Ukraine isn't occupying any parts of Russia. So mm. it's kind of hard for them right. to do those sorts of massacres. I, but, I agree um, with you. Actually, 
totally is don't take any government's word on anything about what they're doing at their word or just at face mm. value. Don't do that because Ooh. of course governments are going to try and, and flip things. But I would say mm. my only condition on this is that I would say, I don't know if it's still the case, but for a long time, you could not access Russia Today and other Russian state owned media websites from the West when the conflict began. And it was also coming out of, remember that of course, the 2020 election uh, and, and the 2016 election in the United States, 2016 election in particular was blamed on on Russian hacking. And Hillary Clinton has never rescinded her statements on that. And she's been adamant about maintaining them. And again, right, I, I don't know if it's still the case anymore, but I remember when I was doing my video on Ukraine, on the, on the history of the conflict, I had to go use a VPN to be able to access Russia today because it wasn't ac uh, accessible even here in um, Guernsey, which is part of the United Kingdom. A really, that's odd to me. I, I think that even if it's state-owned media, which, I mean, mm -hmm. there's tons of state-owned media. The BBC is state-owned media. It's bizarre to me when you can't well, even I, read I it. Well, I want to put a pin there because there is a big <laughs> sure. difference when it comes to editorial control versus, versus the BBC and mm -hmm. RT, which RT will publish reports about Americans eating the big next Putin burger, real thing, <laughs> that is blowing up across the really? nation. That was the real report that they published. <laughs> Not and shocked. the BBC. There, there is a, there, I think there's a stark difference. Mm. But but I think the point stands, right, that I can't, if I can't access it, if no one can access it from the West, that's also, again, it's not direct proof of anything, just like with the Victoria Newland call, not direct proof of anything, but it's weird. And I, I think it's bizarre I don't think to it's restrict weird. I, I don't like it, but I don't think it's weird. I do want to say, like, I am generally, un, I'm very, very radical personally in my free speech beliefs. I don't believe the government should be regulating, quote unquote, hate okay. speech. I don't believe the government should be doing yeah. any of those things. But I also understand why the government's doing it. I don't think it's weird. I think it's because they don't want Russian propaganda to spread. And the easiest way to do it for any government is the, is the simple approach, which is just ban it. If you don't want something to spread, then you ban the speech. So now, I'm not saying that's Ukrainian good, but I mean, okay. it's not weird. We understand why they're doing it. Like when the Ukrainian government bans RT, it's under it's easy to understand why they don't want Russian propaganda that is being used to try to mm -hmm. cause discontent in the country or to undermine it, national security to be spread. I but don't a, like a, it, a, a significant but I, I understand portion why they're doing it. It's not weird. It's not like suspicious. We understand why I they're doing I think it's it. suspicious. A significant portion of the Ukrainian population is our ethnic Russians who speak Russian, and they banned all Russian channels when Zelensky came into power. Well, they didn't ban all, all yeah, Russian they channels. They... Am I wrong about that? That's what the reports well, yeah, say, I, I, so maybe I, I, I'm wrong. What do you mean by Russian? Like, they, they, you can still Language speak channels. Russian. That's still allowed. Yeah. You can still like have Russian-speaking shows. But if it's a Russian show, as in Russian state media, Russian state publications. No, you cannot allow that. That that is not what is allowed. But you can still speak. Like I know a lot of people who host Russian speaking shows. Okay, so my my information on that probably might yeah. be wrong then. But that's well, what the reports. Like, like, here's a, a, well, I'm not there. there. You're there. You're the one. Here's who knows. a here's <laughs> another example with the church. So Tucker Carlson was talking about you know these uh, falsehoods of his having to do with oh Zelensky is persecuting all those poor Christian priests. Meanwhile, you have the Ukrainian branch of the Orthodox Church, which is fully active, no problem with people going to worship. But the church that was specifically persecuted had members who are still to this day members of the well now it's the FSB. Back then it was the KGB. So so, for example, Father Kirill, who is the, or Cyril, who is the head of the Russian Orthodox Church, he was a KGB dude. He was spying on churchgoers yeah. for the KGB. And this is the kind of stuff that Ukraine ends up uh, hammering do, down by, on. By the way. Guys, just quick, that wasn't an evil thing to spy on your fellow church members for any Crazy. government organization. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, her name, uh, the lady's name, Angela Davis. That's who I was thinking of, Angela oh, Davis. Uh -huh. yeah. She was uh, the guest of honor in the USSR. But anyway, back to the uh, important port point here where, yes, we could talk about like these certain instances of censorship here and there, and I'm not a fan of censorship either way. But again, right now, this is a molehill. I want to look at the mountain. And the mountain, to me, has to do with what would be the, uh, the tragic results of the United States not supporting Ukraine. Aiden, you don't think that there would be tragic results, or if there would be, oh. then it's okay. But, like, if your <laughs> position is the United States should uh, not support, uh, you know, through weaponry, Ukraine, nor should the West, then where exactly are we going to be in a couple of years from now if, let's say, um, Russia is going to be rearming once they acquire a certain amount of territory? And, hey, then China's going to look at it and say, hey, now we're a little bit more confident in supporting 
triggering Rush even more. So <clears throat> that's that's my concern. Um, but let me know, like, where where do you see this going? Yeah, if I, if, I, if I can respond to that real quickly, um, first of all. I don't think we should be involved in this conflict because I don't think it, it, it does involve us. This, Like I said in my opening statement, this is a really ancient conflict that is more complex than, and, and Dylan described a lot of the stuff that had happened since, like, since the year of Maidan, but it goes back centuries, actually. This entire, the idea of Ukraine is 30 years old. I'm as old, what? I am the same age as Ukraine. The idea of the modern state of Ukraine is 30 years old. It's after the end of the of the Soviet Union. That's true. Like I said in my opening statement, the current nation of Ukraine includes regions that some people think are part of Romania, some people think are part of Moldova, some people think are part of Czechoslovakia, and some Russians think are part of Russia. The idea of the state of Ukraine is a modern concept. I'm surprised that you don't you don't recognize that actually, Dylan. Well, you that, said you said that the the idea the the idea of the state of Ukraine is thirty years old, but this isn't even the first the Ukrainian modern state. state. There has the been modern the, there state. was the Hetman. There was Ukrainian yes. People's Republic. Uh, a Voltaire yes. wrote about the desire of the Ukrainian people I'm to have their own state, aware. to have their own people. I their culture and language and all of these I things, said that. and their struggle for an independent state goes back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. As in the modern incarnation of the Ukrainian state. Um, this specific government goes back 30 years. But if we were to say that, then we would say, okay, but this only this Russian government, this Russian government we see today, that only goes back 30 years. So like, yes, do yes, they yes, really but... have a claim to Moscow? Do they really have a claim sure. to all this other territory? Sure. Like if, I, if we would apply, if we would have to apply that standard equally to everyone. I, I agree. And, and of course, there's people who think that, you know, um, uh, America being colonized by by White British people largely is also a, a horrible crime and it should go back to, to the native peoples. But however, I would say, like I just said, the modern state of Ukraine includes regions that many people in other nations believe are their, are their clay, right? In terms of Moldova, Romania, um, Czechoslovakia, and Russia. Oh, and Poland as well. Poland, I mean, and Poland you know, yes. We could just say, though, that those countries you just named, none of them are making claims to that Ukrainian territory, and all of them respect. They have been though. The only name, I think, the Romania might be the only one that slightly flirted. Not Romania. Uh, Hungary is the only one I know that slightly flirted with that, at least in recent years. Hmm. I don't think the Romanians have um, said we're going to take this land or that land belongs to us. The government doesn't. No, make but, but, but if you anymore. but if you ask hmm. Romanians, they will say that that part of certain uh, nationalist think... Romanians, but sure. not it's not a hot button issue in Romania. Yeah. Like they don't really care. Yeah. But my, my point is just that because Ukraine as a country, what it is today, was the, the borders were created by the Soviet Union under the Ukrainian SFSR. Yes? Uh, yes. They did not exist 100 years ago, those borders. That, that is was, true for, that, I think, was, the majority of European states. Yes. So, but my point is that what is Ukraine is contested and has been what is Ukraine today is contested by some people and that includes the Russians who think that it by the way that uh, you know that Crimea and um the Donbass are or is their is their land well I'm not I saying they're correct but they it's think not really that contested by I think it is contested by some people but it's a very small minority of the overall population of the of earth Russians that can no the overall if you were if you go by UN votes on what governments and their and their representative democracies or their dictatorships or whatever system they are, and you sit them at the UN, the vote comes back consistently that the vast majority of states recognize Ukraine's 1991 borders mm -hmm. as the secession state after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And the only governments that don't seem to be in this order, Russia, uh, Syria, as in Assad, Syria, North Korea, Eritrea, which is known Even as the there. North Korea of Africa, yes, and I think Belarus, and I might be missing one. I think it might be Venezuela, uh, yeah. the paradise of Venezuela, and those are the only countries that I know of that don't recognize Ukraine's internationally recognized borders. I don't even think the Hungarian government votes against that. Uh, so I'm, not, I, I'm not saying that countries don't largely recognize them. I'm saying that. Well, for I'm just example, saying that have... the position you're putting forward is a radical minority position, mostly held by nationalists. Uh, maybe uh, I I don't know I I haven't I don't have a study in front of me that that has the exact population of, of Russians or Ukrainians who or Romanians or Polish or Moldavians Moldovians who agree with that step. Is, it, is However, it an issue in Romania at all? Uh, I, for some Romanians, from what I've heard from my one Romanian friend, yes, but I don't know if that's a sample size of one. So I don't really know. Yeah. Andrew and, Tate. Um, 
Not Andrew Tate. V. Don't worry about it. No, 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 no. <laughs> not Andrew Tate. He's not Romanian. He's just uh, hopefully uh, in jail yeah. there. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I think that the, the issue that I'm bringing up here, though, about the mm-hmm. border stuff is that there's clearly an issue for some people. Maybe that's a misnomer, though. Maybe that that's... Do you think this is a distraction that's being levied by the Russian government or the Russian people? Oh, I, think, I think the Russian government invasion? and and certain Russians, um, I might even say the majority of Russians, believe that they have they lay claim to certain large sections of Ukraine. And mm-hmm. the Russian government has been explicit that if Ukraine does not follow what is Russia's policy, if it cannot act as an extension of the brotherly nations of Russia and Ukraine, that means basically be with them lockstep and key, yes. then they have a right to go in and abolish the quote unquote gift they gave them of statehood, which again, the Russians didn't give them the gift of statehood. There was statehood before the Bolsheviks came in and crushed that statehood. And so you can't take something away from a people and then give it back to them and then act like a hero, right? You're you're right. You're right, though, because, you know, uh, Russia subsumes uh, Ukraine on, on, under the Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. And then, yes, as has acted as if they were magnanimous in 1990 or 1991 by giving them their statehood back. Um, that's absolutely true. Uh, so, yeah, I'm not. Uh, that is the Russian position um, that they they magnanimously gave gave Ukraine its statehood back. Isn't My only contention is there. Silly, though? It is silly. Of course, it's silly. Yeah. But my, but but part of my contention here, though, is that the, the historical parts of what is Ukraine now are contested by other countries. Maybe just maybe just far right nationalists or just weirdos or whatever. But they are contested. That is undeniable. I think there are people in those countries. I know at least one who thinks that uh, it is Transnistria, right? It's part of Romania. Oh yeah, I mean, what? Wait. Transnistria. No, new Transnistria is in Moldova, is not part of Ukraine, and that was taken by Russia. A, what, what was I thinking about? It was so Transnistria. I can, I can, um, Transnistria is a breakaway state from Moldova that yes, the Russians yes. prop it's up Moldova. through Moldova. Peacekeeper, That's it. Yeah. peacekeepers yeah. that are illegally yeah. deployed in Moldovan territory. Thank you. And Romanians <laughs> believe Moldova Mold- and yeah. Transnistria is part of their country. There we go. It, it's okay. not part of Ukraine. So yeah. that th- this is my point: is that there's some contentions here. I do think Ukraine is a sovereign nation. Yeah, but nation. that's that's a separate conflict entirely, though. That's a whole different thing. Uh, my my point though is that what even is Ukraine right now is based on what was the Ukraine SFSR, right? Mm-hmm. Which was a collaboration and and big chunk of a bunch of other regions that the Russians originally had conquered as part of the Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. That not everyone agrees are Ukrainian because you look at some of those regions. Um, you know, I brought them up here in my opening statement, though, about Bessarabia, Northern Burkovnia. These are areas that um, Herza, Kresi, Carpathian, Ruthenia. That people, oh, Carpathian, Ruthenia is the one that they think is definitely that the Romanians definitely think is theirs. I believe. Um, I'm not saying that that's correct. That's a correct uh, observation. However, that. It's not just the Russians who think they have claims on Ukraine. It's a whole bunch of countries who think they have claims on, Uc- on what is no, currently Ukraine. Not countries, certain people within those countries. Right? Within those like countries. if I believe yes. like okay. Baja, right. ba- Baja, Mexico deserves right. to be ours because I want good beach time. That's <laughs> oh. my position. But that is the position of the majority of Americans <laughs> true, or true. the American government. True. So I don't know where. where well, okay, okay. Where, again, like, let's, there. Yeah. let's look at the. <laughs> let's again look at the bigger picture as far as. Mm-hmm. Aiden, being libertarian, you don't want America to Wait, can, can give Can I touch arms? on one sure. thing, though? Because this topic keeps coming up, and I do want yeah. to address it. It's yeah. the ethnic question, the ethnic Russian mm-hmm. question. Okay. Um, because for me, I think the question is a gigantic distraction from the Russians, in my opinion. I think it's a distraction um, um, trying to make way for a colonialist project, a settler colonialist project. Um, yeah. I, I think that the, the best piece of uh, evidence for this, for me personally, is that in 2008, when Vladimir Putin was asked after the invasion of Georgia, this was right after they invaded and the whole world was terrified because Putin invades Chechnya, Putin inv- after breaking the ceasefire agreement that his government signed. So, oh my gosh, he broke that ceasefire agreement. Now he's invading Georgia. What's he going to do next? And of course, a few years later, he would intervene in Syria. But in this 2008 interview, it's fantastic because this is Putin trying to calm down the world from from the idea that he was going to start invading countries. And so one of the uh, TV hosts asked him, what about Ukraine? What about Crimea? What about the eastern parts of the of, of Ukraine? He says, 
There is no ethnic issue in Ukraine. There is no problem in Ukraine. We recognize that as Ukrainian territory. He said that in 2008. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Six years later, apparently, he had a come-to-Jesus moment. Maybe God came to him in his sleep. I don't know. <laughs> apparently, Nazis have taken over everything in a time of six years. And oh, let's, let's, uh, it just, let's get rid of that fucking Nazi Ukraine. shit. That's so yeah. stupid. And I report on it in my video I made about it, but it's so dumb. Sorry, continue. Oh, and, and you know who was saying that, by the way, back in 2017? Somebody who should have known better? The Red Scare Girls, Anna and Dasha. They were repeating things that as educated Russian women, you would know better than to say that unless you're doing that on purpose. But anyway, that's I mean, just that's I mean, are, are there are there are there Nazis in in Ukraine? Yeah, but there's Nazis everywhere. Like, it's like so... zero point one of the of the far right nationalists got a vote in the Ukrainian parliament. I remember. All like, the in the yeah, all the two percent overall. Yeah, it is yeah. a coalition of yeah. all the far right parties yeah. that wanted to meet the five percent threshold in 2019. So they all came together, right sectors, Azov's old like national core, mm -hmm. Svoboda, uh, Svoboda, and they got yeah. like three point two. And 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 all the Tiana books out, like he he's done so, like so, and, and he's the he's the Nazi guy, but he he was on that considered uh, at one point uh, potentially for a position as PM. He was never going to win it, but he was considered no. for that position at one point. Uh, again, that was not a reality or a real possibility. So are, are there, is there a Nazi adjacent movement in Ukraine? Yes. I think uh, totally denying it is, is wrong and stupid and a bad thing to do. Denying that there's, that there's, that doesn't exist at all is incorrect. And it's, it's not a, doesn't make you look good to do that, but to over inflate it as if like, there's this massive Nazi, neo-Nazi movement in Ukraine is also stupid in my opinion. Yeah, I think, I mean, it, it exists, but I think for the thing that really kicked me about it is I remember I was in here sawing for the uh, for uh, evacuation of civilians when the flooding started and the dam was destroyed and exploded. Mm -hmm. um, it killed, drowned like 20,000 animals, elderly people and disabled people were drowning in their homes. They couldn't get out fast enough. And we were going down there to film the evacuation efforts. Did you think there we was were... a problem with the building of the dam in the first place, though, because it was to cut off fresh water from Crimea? Uh, there, the building, the dam that was exploded was built to cut off fresh water from Crimea. If, maybe I'm talking about a different dam, but there was a dam. You're talking was... about a completely different thing. Okay. So no, the, the dam mind. that we're talking about was built in the 1950s by the Soviet Union in order to produce electricity. And we're talking about yeah, the Novotokovka dam not, that was exploded. Yeah, not, no, not that one, not that one. The one that, that uh, gave fresh water to Crimea. Yeah, that so, one had to yeah. do with the government not wanting to give fresh water to uh, the Crimean yeah. naval base, which required yeah. it to function, yeah. yep. because they mm -hmm. considered it collaborating with the military forces of the occupier. Yep. I, there's, a, there's a certain amount of humanitarian concern that makes me not favorable towards doing what they did, but people leave out the fact that the majority of that water was going to be used for military purposes, which is often left out. But back yeah. to what Sorry, I was saying. Sorry, different dams. Go ahead. <laughs> when the dam was exploded, I went down there to film with evacuation crews. I got up with some Germans. And a few British expats who were doing evacuations, trying to evac animals that were drowning and trying to go back for people's pets that they left behind. Oh. And when we went out on the water, uh, we got shelled by the Russians when we were doing the aid evacuations. My friend John Jones, he got hit uh, in the upper thigh. He was a, he's an elderly British expat. He was about 67, 68. The other thing went in his lower stomach, his lower abdomen, oh. and his pelvis stopped. It is the only thing that ended up saving him. And afterwards, the Russians take video of it and they post it on Telegram and they put like heavy metal on it. I think the song was went like, we're the gods of war. And they were showing them bombing John Jones and the rest of us. And they've got the uh, a ruin in the top left corner that is heavily used by the Nazis. It turns out it was PMC Convoy, which was uh, a PMC that belongs to the head of the Russian occupation forces in, uh, in Crimea, the occupation head, the same one who has deep ties to the mafia and a lot of murders as well. A lot of the occupation forces are just like straight up gangsters. Like, for, for mm -hmm. example, Evgeny Prigozhin, he was a street thug. He was somebody who was deeply yeah, involved with yeah. organized crime. The head of the, uh, Dennis Pushilin, the head of the Donetsk occupation, heavily involved with organized crime. Uh, like the AAA, mark, uh, the AAA marketing scheme, that that fraudster. Well, the entire but, um, Russian government, by the way, is organized -Nazi, crime. That's like a neo-Nazi symbol on the corner of a video of them showing the aid Sun workers. Rod. In this, like, no, 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 it was a different rune. It was a different oh, rune. Yeah. Have, have a, Who cares? There's a bunch of different runes. Yeah, you get, I got but it. But <laughs> them combined with Rusich, which is an openly neo Nazi <sighs> militia, it's hard for me to take it seriously that you care about stopping neo Nazism if you're sending neo Nazi militias to fight neo Nazism. It just, it never, yeah. it never connected with me. I never bought it.
No, it's a, it's it's, I it's a dumb. It, I think it's trying to uh, yeah. beat up Slavic sentiment because Slavs hate Nazis for good reason. And so, if you can call your <laughs> yeah. opponent Nazis, then you've got a reason to go fight and kill people. Hmm. I mean, and the history behind that, it, it, it's very old. It goes back to, again, because like, why did uh, the Ukrainians join with the with Hitler's regime in the first place? Because they wanted their independence. So that was from from Russia. That was why there was any kind of U uh, Ukrainian um, sentiment that aligned with the National Socialists in the first place. And it's it's crazy to think that we're 80 years out and we're seeing kind of the same thing is that Ukrainians still want their independence from Russia and Russia's still trying to take over Ukraine and that the whole reason that they aligned with the Nazis in the first place to any extent that they did um, was to be independent. So I will I will just say and I don't think this was your purpose but I love bringing it up every time. Sure. More Ukrainians <laughs> died fighting the Nazis than any yes. other group that made up the oh. USSR. I believe it was like a, a ratio yeah. of like 4 million people like 40 to 47 percent of the casualties were Ukrainian. And what a lot. And I, it really bothers me seeing so many people whose grandfathers fought hand in hand with the Ukrainians mm -hmm. now pointing around and pointing at like what must have been one one hundredth of the size of Ukrainians that were fighting for the Nazis yeah. and say you were a Nazi state, even though Ukrainians contributed more than many other states in the world to the defeat of Nazism. Absolutely. Yeah, that wasn't my point. Um, yeah, no, I'm just bringing I, I, it up because think... because the neo because the neo the unique neo Nazi history of Ukraine thing bothers me because there were more Russian collaborators with the, the with the Nazis from mm -hmm. their POW camps than there were Ukrainians. There was Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians. Anytime opportunities can take advantage for their of own course. power and gain. And they, they will do that sort of thing. I yeah, mean, think the, of the uh, Katyn massacre, what was going on there. It was I was on watching Katyn, actually. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Horrifying. One of yeah. the most, which, which I'm always shocked that people don't even know about Katyn to this day. It, it's yeah. basically like unknown history where, oh, I, I mean, from the descriptions that I've read, when the Nazis are sickened by your, your, mass killing of people i think you've done a little bit of a fuck up <laughs> i think when, when even nazis are going what the hell happened here that's yeah you did a big oops mm. um to put it lightly um by the way before we uh before we keep going everybody number one be sure to uh like click the bell and also sneed those super chats if you guys have any <laughs> questions we are going to be addressing those questions towards the end but again i wanted to as the great jen psaki used to say circle back to the original question for Aiden, which was, since you do not support America aiding Ukraine, what are possible repercussions that you can imagine are going to happen yes. if America is not going to aid Ukraine? Let's go from there. Yes, I'm glad you brought that up because I had it in my head. So let's, um, in terms of possible repercussions, I mean, they're multiplicitous. I don't know. I don't. I don't think anyone knows. I, Russia is a, to quote. Um, who said this? Kamala Harris. Yes, Kamala Harris. <laughs> Ukraine is a country and Russia is a bigger country next to Ukraine. Yes, yeah, so Russia has more resources. We know this. They have more money. They have more military resources. However, Ukraine has held out and it has largely held out with the resources of the West or the aid of the West. Would you agree with that or not, uh, Dylan? Because you're there and you, you know it better um, than I do. When I when I first came here, uh, and uh, I went to the Ford, operation, Ford operating position in Zaporozhye. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I saw them using World War II era machine guns uh, on the front line of the war. Ooh. And so for me, seeing that type of stuff, I'm of the belief that the Ukrainians would have fought no matter what. In those mm -hmm. early months, the, the West were like sending over Germany, for example, sent over like 300, like 3000 helmets. There was like a lot of the aid was much smaller. And I think later in the war, now in the war, their their fighting ability is in large part due to the West. But those early months that were crucial for Ukraine to stay an independent state, I think mm -hmm. that was 80 to 90 percent Ukraine and then reforming their own system. But I think now now that we're in for the long haul, their allies are definitely um, pulling like a lot of, of a decent lion's share of the logistical support. Well, Ukraine, it's not a. Um, it's a very impoverished country in the broad scheme of things, right, comparatively to let's say America or the UK, right? Yep. It, it's not, they, they don't have a, I mean, they, they produce an enormous amount of food, enormous amount of grain, enormous amount of, of uh, resources, but they don't have the money that the West does. So I think they have been required to rely on Western support. It's interesting that you, you say that. I think that's probably what I expected, honestly, <clears throat> that they were holding up on their own with what they had. But 
are now largely relying on, on Western resources. The problem that I have with it, again, as a libertarian, as I brought up, is that the U.S. has spent $75 billion. That's just the U.S. That doesn't include the United Kingdom. That doesn't include the rest of Europe. Mm -hmm. It's a huge expenditure. And I'm not, I know it, it comes off as callous for me to say like, well, it, 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 it does come off as callous. There's no other way to describe it. It comes off as callous. But I don't think it's callous. It's just not our, it's not our war. It's not our conflict. Mm -hmm. So for me, I, I can't justify spent, you know, uh, I've said this before talking about this, uh, the Ukraine thing, but I, I live on a really small island with about 85,000 people, not even, I think probably like 75,000 people. And right after the war started, I went down to a crepe shop in town, and there is this deific mosaic of Zelensky in front of their shop. Like he's like painted like Jesus. And I was like, what? What is happening? Where th this small island off the coast of England in France is is painting a, a deific mo mosaic of Zelensky, and and every other house has it. Well, not every. It's not, I'm over exaggerating. But mm -hmm. you see all these Ukraine flags flying here in Guernsey. I, that's bizarre to me. I, I do think it's it's a lot of its virtue signaling. And I don't think it's about actual concern about any of this. And I really don't think it's the West, in, in the West broadly speaking, in terms of America and the and the UK. Can that I defend be, the world's wine moms for a moment? Go ahead. Can I defend <laughs> the wine moms? Yeah, go ahead. So I, I think that a lot of people in those early months mm -hmm. really connected with Ukraine's struggle that they heard the plea that Zelensky made very well. He has a history yeah, of yep. training. He's trained in media. He's an actor. He's a very yeah. good public speaker. Um, he's um, very human in the way he presents himself in, in comparison to a lot of other politicians. He's not Have like you a seen the TV guy. show? Do you speak um, in I did. Creed? I didn't like it. I didn't like it, the show. I watched a little bit of it. It was okay. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it, there's a, like a very different humor here. Mm -hmm. um, there's a very different humor here. But I, I didn't like it, uh, like the show serving other people that much, which my audience dragged me through the mud for. But... <laughs> I think that a lot of people saw those massacres, saw Ukraine struggle for democracy. Many of them started learning about what was really the West ignoring what was happening in Ukraine for eight years or just kicking the can down the road, hoping mm -hmm. that the problem would solve itself with no plan in place on actually how to resolve it. And then they connected with that story and you could see the polling data shift for people wanting to support them. Americans, for example, remember the idea of uh, uh, have a very favorable idea of a nation fighting for the democracy against an authoritarian monarch style system that's coming to try to rule over them. And if you talk to a lot of Ukrainians and how they talk about Siege and the history of Ukraine and that type of Cossack freedom, a lot of Americans will really connect with that. Like, oh yeah, I know that's kind of like our cowboy freedom down here in Texas. Oh yeah, that's kind of like that kind of freedom that I have down here. In, and that connection that a lot of people made as well as seeing just the horrific atrocities that were being done in what was these, um, you know, these quote unquote cleansing operations. That's what the Russian called, the Russians called it in their internal communications. That's not, not a term I'm using. That's what they use. They call it cleansing mm -hmm. operations in Kiev, Ooh. shooting people with their hands tied behind their back, extrajudicial executions, castration of POWs, uh, filming the execution of POWs, yep. sledgehammer killings, sometimes of their own soldiers when they don't want to fight. I think a lot of people saw that, and then they saw the mass graves. And when you're finding over 440 bodies in a village of, of a small city of like 16,000, when the majority have already fled, th this is these are slaughters that we haven't seen since the genocides in Yugoslavia on the scale mm -hmm, of, of mm -hmm. the slaughters. And so I think that them wanting, feeling powerless to stop that violence they see, they're trying to search for some way they can voice like. This is wrong. This is wrong. We said never again. And we're seeing on the same continent, a, a ethnicity trying to be, have their national identity, everything wiped off the face of the earth in occupied territory, which the Russian government has admitted to at this point. Yes. that That is the goal. We can we can see it from how they're taking these kidnapping children and bringing them to patriot camps in Russia. And so I think that them feeling powerless in that way and wanting to just show some sort of like, yes, I agree with these people who are fighting for their freedom. We sympathize with that. I have a history from my family in Ireland who fought for freedom. I have a history of my family in this country or that country. And we fled to America as a refugees and immigrants. And we see yeah. the cameras. So I, I understand that it might be cringe when wine moms engage in politics or foreign <laughs> policy, especially if they don't know all of the intricacies of it. 
but I think it comes from a really good place. And I think it was, it, it makes sense that they responded in that way. Hmm. I, I guess what, by the way, I agree with everything that you said, like completely. That was, I, I believe that's absolutely where the support came from. That's, the, that's the why mom, but it's, <clears throat> it, it is based on like truly, I think deep empathy that people have. And, and it is kind of great that people have so much empathy in this world, which is so weird and fucked up in so many ways. And yet people are still able to have that kind of sympathy and empathy. However, I what I worry about is that we are looking at, in terms of America's involvement, no, America's not involved directly, militaristically, but I don't want this to be Vietnam that's or, or, or Korea. And that's where I think my contentions come with or, or come from, is that um, I know that United States history of involving or Afghanistan of involving itself in foreign wars. I mean, Afghanistan is probably the most relevant example. Or um, uh, where's Gaddafi from? Geez, my Libya. brain's not from working Libya. on that. One. Libya. Libya. Ooh, weird stuff with that one in Gadda with Gaddafi uh, and the United States involvement and the French, by the way. Also, um, I feel uncomfortable with that. Mm. It's it's still at the end of the day a conflict between these peoples which does not directly involve the United States. It indirectly involves us, involves us absolutely, but doesn't directly involve us. And that's where I find myself at conflict and at odds with this, is that I don't think it's our place ever, honestly, to involve ourselves in foreign wars. I don't think the United States should be involved in Afghanistan. We shouldn't have been involved in, in Libya. We shouldn't have been involved in, in Korea or uh, in Vietnam. And that's, way, that's, that's really where my contention is. And when it comes to the, the Vietnam comparison, um, mm -hmm. the Russians don't have a bad memory of the war in Vietnam. We have a bad memory of the war in Vietnam. And so if the comparison is being made, I think that Americans would have to switch places because we're mm. not the ones sending our troops over there to die. It's the Russians sending the troops over there to die. In this scenario, we're the Russians supporting the Vietnamese. We're the Americans supporting the Ukrainians, not putting our troops on the ground to die, but supporting them financially and with weapons. And that so I, I think that the, these bad memories we have of Vietnam being a failed war. If you ask the Soviet officials if it was a failed war, they're going to say, no, it was a massive success. If you ask the Vietnamese if it was a failed war, they're going to be like, no, we mm. won. Of course it wasn't a failed war. If you talk to average mm. Russians at the time, they're going to be like, we helped another country liberate themselves from the scourge of global capitalism and degenerate, whatever. <laughs> the, that's, the, the I'm Soviet sure that's Marxist true. Line was. And I'm so sure I, I feel like that bad memory might be the wrong. I, I think citing Vietnam isn't completely wrong, but I think that the the trauma that Americans have with it. I was raised by a Vietnam veteran. I was raised by my grandfather. I don't think that is is being directed in the right way because we would have to switch our places in a way there. Um, as for the seventy five billion, now this is just a quick point, and I like to bring mm -hmm. this up. Um, I don't like how a lot of this aid has been counted because a lot of it has been done in a really finicky bookkeepy way that I think is kind of scummy. Um, for example, let's say oh, we boy. make a, a, a Vietnam troop carrier. We have one. We'll take the original construction price when it was made in 1962, and we'll use that instead of what it is worth now, and we'll say that's how much we sent over. And then Th that would be worse. That would be worse though for the calculation. Um, it would no, no, no. It means we're taking the original amount. Let's just say it's 10 million, even though now it's worth two million, and we'll say we sent 10 million dollars in assets over. But in terms of how much really it, it, it was over two million. But in terms of how much it cost to make via today's money, that's how they're getting the calculation. Yes, yeah, so they're saying they sent over more than they actually did. That's what I'm saying. Well, I get you, but uh, I don't think that's an inaccurate calculation uh, to say that like it cost in today's money this much to build the fighter jet or whatever that we sent over. I'm not sure that that's an what inaccurate I, what I'm calculation. saying is if something was made in 1960 and it cost 10 million then, are we but sending we don't use it entirely and it's in, like, 1960? era technology because i know like we are we are sending over. we sent over a lot of vietnam era troop carriers okay, we sent okay. over i know that the polish sent over a lot of old soviet mm -hmm, tanks mm -hmm. that they had in their stockpiles yep. but a lot of the how it was counted is they would mm -hmm. say the original number even though it's not worth that anymore because it's old now it's only mm -hmm. either it's rusty it has problems pieces are missing sometimes that they have to replace um it's just like outdated so at the time it was top of the line and so it was worth a lot more okay. But now it isn't. And so mm. a lot of times countries would say we, they would count mm. the full amounts of what it was worth originally to bloat up how much they've sent so they can say they've contributed more, mm. even though they haven't. And the United States practiced that in a lot of counting of its aid. They also tried to include replacement costs, which I think was the was the peak of scummy behavior. 
trying to include replacement costs when talking about these aid products. But that's mm-hmm. besides the point. We have certainly spent billions of dollars in aid and sending it over. Yes. I do think it is the United States' place to support Ukraine, especially considering considering the commitments that we've made to them before. When we asked, they're not part of NATO. Well, they're not part of NATO, but that doesn't mean we can't have other commitments to them. And we did have other commitments to them. Uh, we asked them to give up the nuclear stockpiles under the idea. And they did. And if they, yes, and they did. Under the idea that if they gave up the nuclear stockpiles, the United States and Russia said this too, but Russia is obviously not going to do this, that the United States and Russia would come to their aid and support them if their territorial integrity was threatened. Yes. Everyone knew at the time that a nuclear stockpile was the number one guarantee of sovereignty. No one's going to invade a country if they have the ability to nuke one of your major cities and wipe it off the face of the earth. Yeah, that nuclear guarantee on that is stronger 100%. than so many other things. But out of the interest of nuclear arms control, out of the interest of wanting to have as many points of failure, I mean, having as few points of failure for a nuclear disaster to occur from one of these sometimes corrupt um, one of these states that are experiencing bureaucratic decay, who don't have a lot of money to go around, the last thing we wanted was some rusty old nuclear stockpile controlled by a government that we don't know exactly what direction it's going to go in. It, and, it wasn't. And, it wasn't just Ukraine. It was a ton of countries sold their nuclear weapons back to Russia. That is true. And there was agreements made that they would be respecting of territorial integrity. And we wanted them to do it. We encouraged them to do it because we wanted as few points of failure for a nuclear disaster. We wanted to be able to tell the world, look, we got nukes and we'll use our nukes to protect all, all these countries so they don't have to get nukes. So there's less. And Russia has the most nukes. Russia has the, Russia most nukes. the next most oh, nukes. Oh, by an insane amount. You ever see that video where it just mm-hmm. shows you the visual? The, the visualization of how many nukes Russia has compared to every other country, it's unbelievable. They do have a lot of nukes. A lot of them, though, are like, it's... Yeah, they're old, so... Like, very it, old it nukes, but a lot of them are like smaller tactical nukes. Mm-hmm. They're not like this, mm-hmm. like the yeah, very yeah. large... But still, they have a lot of nukes. They are well, the, the not, most, not czar bombas, they are the most right? up yeah. nuke country of all the nuke right. countries. Well, Dylan, just but, um, real uh, quick... My, my, my large sure. point is that yeah. if... If we're going to make these types of commitment to countries and ask them to give up that ultimate form of security, and we want to encourage other countries down the line to also participate in denuclearization, which I think is beneficial for everybody on the earth, then we're going to have to respect okay. our security agreements we make with them. Hmm. But also, just, just to be real, quick, uh, real uh, <laughs> yeah. quick here, when it comes to the amount of money, like the total amount of money of the uh, U.S. defense budget, from what I understand, Dylan, is it around 6% that's currently been uh, spent of the total U.S. defense no, that budget? No, was, I think that's a little high. I think it's about 4%, uh, but the total percentage of GDP would be about 0.3%. So, mm. but here's my issue. I, I think the U.S. defense budget is already insane. Uh, it, I, I don't like how much we're spending on any of it. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm a libertarian. At the end of the day, I think most taxation is theft. Not all, but most. Um, so sorry, <laughs> I have to throw out my libertarian taxation is theft thing there. Mm-hmm. Um, but can I ask uh, a question? You said you're. Sure. I, I heard somebody told me you're a libertarian monarchist. Is that I true? Am. I am. Yes. So can I take a guess at what it is? Do having done no re- no research because I'm, <laughs> I'm I want to see if I'm just vaguely right. Sure. So. Having done no research and just having it flip in my mind for 24 hours, is it that, you know, instead of trusting some large spanning bureaucracy that reaches into communities all across the country, you centralize a small amount of power rung around a few figures in order to make it so the government doesn't really interact with you on a day to day life unless it's yes. absolutely necessary in, absolutely. for example, nuclear disaster or something like that? Uh, I want as little government involvement in my day-to-day life as absolutely possible, which is why I favor a monarchy, yes. And I think that the best way to preserve libertarianism as an idea, the best way to make – because libertarianism doesn't fucking work. We all know this. Um, I agree. (laughs) Obviously. But the only way to make it work is under a monarchical system. That's why I'm a libertarian monarchist because it's only under a libertarian system where it could work because I think – basically, if you look at like um, feudalism, which I know people hate, but um, if you look at like a feudalistic system, that would have been the only way in which you could have had a a semblance of libertarianism that worked uh, and that is only under monarchy. I don't think you can get it under any other system, certainly not democracy, certainly not communism, certainly not socialism. It's only under monarchy and under which I think it um, And then you get a king and a queen and a cute prince. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> it's also called a f- f- feudalism because there's a few dolls around for people to play with because they're working all the time in the fields. No, do you, do you wait? You really want to bring that one up? <laughs> all right, go for it. Go for it. You did, oh, you didn't know that that people the who holidays the the, uh... had had more holidays than they do now. They worked less less days of the year. 
But I, now I, in a farming system, I'm not want to. I don't want to get into this. All right, but, yeah, we'll save that for um, another also, time. Also, it's it's fal- what the argument I'm making is fallacious. So just ignore it. It's yeah. uh, bullshit. So <laughs> maybe they're made like little dolls what? out of straw. Or it's something. a nice. It's a nice know. like argument to make about numbers, but it's fallacious. No, so uh, I th- before we get into the cost aspect, which I th- I think we could talk about in the moment, and I have some interest. I, I think I have some things I wanted to touch on there. Mm-hmm. I just I wanted a just a response to what I said about nuclear arms control because I think that's something that is clearly with not only the United States interest, but that's in the interest of the world. It's part of the reason why the Chinese, even though they're buying uh, Russian crude exports, even though they could never make up for what they've lost in Europe, they just don't have the infrastructure in place. Um, they have made very clear that if they were to engage in something like that, they would not have China's support because they want mm-hmm. to also, if they don't engage in some like nuclear attack or something like that, which certain, while I don't think it's very likely, certain Russian state talking heads have talked quite about quite yes, a lot yeah. about it and the drunker dmitry medvedev likes to rant about it on twitter and his midnight whiskey ranting but it's does medvedev always drunk when he tweets because it certainly I, seems like it some russia watchers and i kind of am sympathetic to this believe that he purposely asks like it acts like a drunkard fool to make himself look like less of a threat to putin mm. so putin doesn't get any ideas about him oh uh, maybe maybe it's possible the old uh, khrushchev strategy that's uh... well, yeah Kr- khrushchev the infamous drunk my God, that man. Yeah, that's yeah, how he was able to say what I'm saying about uh, nuclear arms control. And I think this is an interest that the United States should. I mean, we make it a commitment. I think we should have our word respected around the world, which that's a massive problem right now because we keep flip flopping on all of our international mm-hmm. policies, whether it be the Iran deal or any other number of. And that's mm-hmm. another that's another example of us flip flopping yeah. on nuclear arms control. I think we should stick what, to our commitments, and I think this is benefit for, for the world. Iran. Excuse me. They find for Iran to yeah keep their their nuclear armaments. The the whole um. Uh, contention or, or debate about y- Ukraine uh, disarming. I said in my video that I made two years ago now that Ukraine shouldn't have disarmed. I-, I think that the whole situation that we're dealing with right now is a result of the fact that Ukraine was disarmed nuclearly by the larger uh, global political community, which should never have happened. Ukraine should have been able to keep their nuclear armaments. And I don't think if, if they had nuclear weapons, Russia would never have invaded. In it would my never opinion. violate their non-aggression principle. Yep. Okay. Could I could I ask you a follow-up question? Sure. And this is I just want to like and I don't want to I'm not trying to put you in like a box here, but I would like a like make it as simple as possible because I'm trying to like build the blocks mm-hmm. of what you believe in my mind. Do you also believe in abolishing NATO? I think NATO is disgusting. I think it shouldn't exist. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so I just wanted to ask I we would all have to realize that if we were to both abolish NATO and also say, hey, Ukraine, we're not going to come to your defense after saying we would come to your defense kind of in this type of situation. We should never have then, done that. Then every Eastern European country is going to race to get nuclear weapons. And most likely, not only every Eastern European country, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, mm-hmm, Poland, mm-hmm. who is, is GDP is exploding. So they're going to probably have the money to even yeah, they're doing towards well. it. Uh, Ukraine would probably do it. Um, all these different countries would go for that, and that would create more points of failure, which could create a nuclear crisis down the line. What the, the, the whole idea of the nuclear crisis is that if everyone's armed, then it's not an issue. My, my problem with NATO is really? that, is that it, if it, from, that's from, not from, a libertari- from a libertarian true. perspective, I, I, I do believe that. But that, that assumes completely rational actors, and I, do, and I don't believe in statecraft that we have completely true, rational true, actors. True, 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 absolutely true. Uh, however, to risk nuclear holocaust is a really big deal. I don't think even that's my point. I I don't think even irrational actors. I mean, how irrational do you have to be to risk a nuclear holocaust in your country? Well, like, a lot pretty of pretty insane. More, and I, people say that mm-hmm. Putin's like insane, but or that Trump was insane. But I don't think either one of them. I, and I, I say this, but I don't think Putin's a good guy. He's an ex KGB, mm-hmm. but I don't think he'd risk nuclear holocaust. I agree it, with that. I don't think he's that nuts. Um, and by the way, a lot oh, of the shit, Russian oligarchs. Point, I forgot it. <laughs> oh, sorry, a lot mm-hmm. of the Russian oligarchs, they have a family, like especially their kids in the West, in Europe. You know, mm-hmm. they're living a lavish lifestyle there uh, still. So I don't think they would want Europe or the United That's States true. where their kids are at to get uh, nuked. But the other thing here that I think we got to keep in mind is we are going to set a really horrible precedent if any country like Russia, for example, could say, we're going to nuke you if you don't allow us to acquire this territory. Once people start to give up territory whenever those kind of threats are made, then all bets are off. But isn't that what the U.S. has been doing for like 100 years? 
But here's the thing. I see a big difference between the United States and uh, Russia as far as how they uh, handle things. Uh, Dylan, what do you think? I, I think that but the difference between, I would say, for example, us invading a country and how Russia's invaded Ukraine is when we invaded Iraq, there was never any like moment where the American government was like, we're going to nuke Baghdad. We're going to if you don't if you don't give up, we're going to we're going to wipe every Iraqi child off the face of the earth. We spent the big 10 old years explosion. killing Iraqi children. Well, yeah, but that's well, that's not really my point is the morality sure, of the sure. invasion of Iraq. Yeah. I don't like the invasion of Iraq. My point is we never waved the nuclear button around when we were invading Iraq. Same thing with Afghanistan. Um, and the closest I can think of is there were some radical generals during Vietnam that didn't really go anywhere. The last time it was seriously talked about was Korea when nobody else had nukes. Do you and think so that I do it, think it, there it is a significant though. difference between us invading, doing our intervention in Vietnam, failing and running away with a tail between our legs, the Soviets intervening in Afghanistan, failing, going with their legs tails between their legs and what has happened here which is they're following the same pattern they invade ukraine it's starting to not go exactly how they planned and instead of doing what would be normal in statecraft which would be you know okay mm -hmm. you know this is a lost cause that's skedaddle let's not push the sword deeper in our stomach they're trying to lean upon their nuclear arsenal to try to gain concessions which if we were to concede to could encourage that behavior down the line include which would, one, encourage more people to get nuclear weapons, creating more points of failure for nuclear weapons, and two, could also just encourage people to engage in this type of behavior down the line and, and lean on nukes more. What kind of do, message do, would do you send for do, do the Pakistanis that, or the North Koreans? Sure, but don't, don't you think that even though the United States never directly threatened Afghanistan or Iraq or Vietnam or well, I think we did actually make a threat in Korea. We did make, with, well, with, MacArthur made a threat and he got fired for it. Yes, he did. Yeah, in Korea. Okay, Has yeah. Has that happened to anybody in Russia who's made that type of threat? No, but my point is, is not the threat of nuclear armaments inherent and implicit in any, in any uh, military involvement that the United States has in a foreign country? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's so, an idea that if Al-Qaeda was to form a standing army and take Colorado, right. that we would have the, that we would not, not even, It wouldn't have to be that. It, it's not even that it's severe. Any well, what situation would you roll out where we with, use a nuke well, no, outside I'm, I'm, of America being invaded itself? Well, I don't think it. I don't think it matters. It's that any military action that the United States involves itself in, it, it it always carries with it the threat because we're the only country that has actually done it, right? We're but the, the dynamics only country have changed that's actually done it significantly since when we dropped the A bomb. I, I, on I the know. Japanese. I know. I, I know it has, but the threat implicitly is always there, isn't it? That we've got the nukes. We are the only nation to have ever used them. Isn't that implicitly terrifying? I don't think the second part nation? really matters all that much because the but dynamics have shifted. Well, no, because the dynamics have shifted so much. When you are the only country with nukes, and then that changes to there are multiple countries with nukes that have stockpiles that can destroy the world, the dynamics have shifted so much that really judging pre other country having nukes to after co other countries having nukes, nuclear policy. Is, it's almost impossible because now there's a world ending potential when before all that would happen is we wipe a city off the face of the earth, right? That doesn't mean the world can end or we have our own cities wiped off the face of the earth. The introduction of these other nukes changed the dynamic so significantly that I don't think the dropping the A-bomb on Hiroshima really has much of anything to do with a possible nuclear threat when it comes to the war in Ukraine. Maybe, maybe. But I do think the implicit the implicit. I think it's implicit, exists, though. But there is a difference yeah. between the implicit threat of... At a certain point, if you cross enough red lines, America would be willing to use its nuclear stockpile to defend its internationally recognized territory, which has historically been the same position of Russia and is still the same position mm -hmm. of Russia. And we invade, we get our ass beat, they snatch our pockets, they take our they 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 take our lunch money. And because they took our lunch money, now we're threatening to blow up the world. That's suicide bomber it, politics. That's well, very it, it, different yeah. than what was happening before, and it's not behavior we should encourage. However, I think that it's, it, again, I think it's implied. Because whenever America gets involved into a conflict, it's implied. And, it, and by the way, like I said in my opening statement, it's the same thing involved with it's Russia. Not a, but the, the, I think the it is implied because Russia... threat is not if we invade you and fail, we're going to nuke you. The implied threat is if you invade America and America's internationally ter recognized territories, I'm, I'm not sure that's true. Nuke you. I'm so not sure when, that's when true. is that threat ever manifested in that? I mean, way, it, has, it has not manifested in the past. Of course, America. Uh, bombs Japan because Japan hit um, 
uh, hit Hawaii. But Nikki Pearl Harbor. However, the implicit threat's always there. And that's what I think actually matters about it. And it's not just and it's not just America, by the way, because again, like I said, the company, the company, the country that has the most nukes is Russia. If Russia mm-hmm. has the most nukes, are they, are they all useful? To, are they, do they all actually work? I don't know. I would probably guess that a whole bunch of them are not functional, despite the pure numbers calculation. That being said, it is an implicit threat that if Russia feels as if it should use nukes, they certainly have them in their catalog to be able to use them. Same with the United States. And that is why I believe people or, or countries are um, are afraid of the United States, and rightfully so. And why they're also afraid of Russia, and rightfully so. But I don't, I, I don't actually think that the nukes is the main motivator to what makes people afraid of the United States. I think what makes most of America's enemies afraid of the United States is the fact that within 20 minutes we could hit a pin from a, a 2,000 yep. miles away with one of our Reaper drones. That's yep, the true. thing that's terrifying about America is that we have eyes and ears and bases everywhere. True. It, true. When you talk to al-Qaeda fighters, they're not saying we fear the day America drops the A-bomb on, on the Taliban headquarters. No, yeah, they're I not think, I think the day of the nuke is honestly over, but it is it is still this like thing in the back of people's brains. Mm-hmm. The, the, rightfully so. Of course, that but exists. the thing is that implicit bi- that implicit fear exists with every single nuclear armed state that, that exists sure. with China, that exists yeah. with Russia. Yeah. But the explicit threat has always been, and I think that the implicit threat has always been around that is that if Russia's internationally recognized territory is threatened, if Russia's territory is threatened, then they can use the nuke. Then that is a situation where they use the nuke. Now yeah. we're talking about the goalpost shifting. And possibly moving the goalpost to if we go into a war and we start losing, then we can suicide bomber the world and say we'll blow up everything unless you give us mm. Ukraine, unless you concede us this way and back off of your international commitments to protect them. Which if we were to allow that to happen and concede to that, what? why would that not send the signal to Kim Jong-un? Well, it looks like I have an actual viable true. invasion strategy of South Korea. I mean, true, true. Uh, and, and what is not? Uh Oh, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that one. <laughs> and I think you're right about that. Oof. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have a well, response to that. Well, other than I think that's no, yeah, a good you can, point. You can think about it and get back to me at, at another time. No, no, no. I think, I think it's, I think, no, I think it's a good point. I, I don't, I don't have an answer to that one. I don't, I don't have a snap. Well, the, uh, the thing, the thing the in the back. I, in these yeah. environments, it's very much encouraged to like, you need to have your immediate response to everything. But if somebody Not has never heard it before, I, I would want you to marinate on it for a bit, right? No, Aiden, you're great. Yeah, I don't give a like, shit. Like, you're, I, I, like the thing about Aiden that I, that I find is that she's not like – like I noticed, for example, in the bread tube community, everybody's just like playing kind of like this role as an actor well, like, and wanting rah, 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 you know? Yeah, yeah. wanting to be just like some kind of a performance artist. But I find that like right now between the two of you guys, like I think that we're able to talk very civilly and regardless of any difference of opinions, our goal is to figure out what exactly is the best way forward rather than trying to I, make some kind of an act. And I think that's very I mean, I, ha- I have strong opinions uh, on the Ukraine conflict, which is that I don't think the United States should be involved. However, I am open to having my mind changed. And there are arguments that could be made, obviously, that could change my mind. Um, I, I find it. Just want to put this out. I find it weird. Of course, this is like I think framed as a debate, but I'm not like a debate bro person. I think you are a little bit, Dylan, but I'm not. So my whole opinion. Sorry, I, 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 I'm I, not I, trying to okay. debate real hard. It's okay. I, I have opinions on things. They're mostly based on data, but I'm always willing to be and actually open to being proven wrong. So that's why I. The only reason I like to talk to people is. <laughs> <laughs> to uh, get better information. Can I can I just ask you matters. a question? Because mm-hmm. you said that you're you you said you're open to having your mind changed. Yeah, sure, of course. Uh, I do need why else, to. Why somebody else just talk? sent me this, and I just <laughs> want to ask. Somebody said on Twitter, "What sent me this tweet that you said? Mm-hmm. What would convince you that it's beneficial for the West to support Ukraine?" And you responded, "Nothing, because it's not our business." So, are you open to having your mind changed? I said that. And that is true. I did say that yesterday. I think um, it would be really hard for you to convince me that that we should financially support Ukraine or, or um, militaristically uh, supply Ukraine with uh, munitions, because I, even though I understand the plights, even though I understand everything that you've said, I still don't understand why it's the United States job to do this. Cause mm-hmm. I don't like the United States being world police. I actually find it imperialistic and disgusting. And I don't think we should be involved in any other country's business whatsoever. I don't know how imperial, if a, if a nation state openly asks for military support, 
and says, we want to defend our sovereignty. You can either mm-hmm. send us, sell us these guns, send us these guns, lend lease program, whatever. I don't think it's necessarily imperialistic for us to give them the means to do that. And like, unless what, what definition of imperialism are you using? Cause for me, whether or not we use that word, which I know is like, you know, it's like the dirty, um, scary word. Char- charged. Yeah. It, it, I'm, it's I'm a very charged to... word. I think that sending weapons to their, to your allies to defend yourself and using that to have the same word to describe that as we would colonizing South Africa. Is, and Ukraine, like, is Ukraine our ally? Legally, they're not. Not under NATO. I Ukraine mean, it depends on what involved? you mean by the term ally, but they're exactly. certainly our, I don't they're know. Certainly our <laughs> partner, strategic partner. Well, here, here's is, the problem. What, I think we're all I think we're all kind of in the weeds right now and not focusing mm-hmm. on what I think is the most important thing, which I think hardly ever gets mentioned, which was the original question that I was asking Aiden, which is, let's oh. say we got rid of NATO. Let's say, Aiden, you become a, a queen of the United States. All right. And you get rid of uh, any NATO support. No, I don't. What a are at all. Fuck that. what are the repercussions <laughs> that are now going to occur as far as what Russia is going? going to do in the next several months what russia is going to do in the next several years when it comes to the rest of europe as well as what china is going to do these are the consequences Mm -hmm. that must be looked at when it comes to well why should america care so aiden thank you love uh, play the picture for us what exactly is going to happen once you get rid of nato i said earlier i had a question i forgot it that was it i don't um i really don't appreciate nor think it's logical for, and I keep seeing this, I've been like, well, if we don't stop Russia at Ukraine, they'll just keep going, they'll just keep going west. I think that's fallacious. I don't think that's uh, accurate at all. But Dylan, you would know better than I would. Do you think that Russia has intents on continuing to move uh, to move west in terms of their uh, conquest? Because I don't see any evidence of that. It seems to me that this is a specific issue involving Ukraine. That Russia thinks that they have a uh, that they have sovereignty over, um, mm-hmm. whether it's Putin or, or or the Russian people, I don't know. I, I think it's largely Putin, but whatever. They think they have sovereignty over Ukraine. I, mm-hmm. however, I keep seeing these people on Twitter and stuff saying that well, it's today it's Ukraine, tomorrow it's Germany. I don't see any evidence of that. So I'm interested in your perspective. Well, I don't know if it would be today Ukraine, tomorrow Germany, but I don't think the Russians are going to stop at Ukraine. Um, really? I think Putin made this very cl- clear at the start of the war. When I think the best way to look at Putin's intentions is at the start of the war, he made a big speech. And I believe that when someone tells you who they are, you believe them, right? Mm-hmm. I don't think I need to like psychoanalyze Putin and like you, his hand did three shakes, which means he's going to invade Moldova on the 22nd. I see all these <laughs> different ways people try to like monitor these regimes. The same thing with North Korea. When you get so little information on the inner workings of these regimes, people's imaginations start to run wild. But at the start of the invasion, Putin laid out a framework that he could use to intervene in most post-Soviet states, which was that the Russia is the uh, inheritor of the Soviet state, and they gifted all of these countries, it's including true. Ukraine, their sovereignty, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Romania, Moldova, all, well, Moldova somewhat because they did the breakaway transistor region. But all these countries that they gave them their, their statehood, and they... Uh, that was a gift, and they hold the right to take that gift back. That was something he said at the very start of the war. He did say and that. I, I forgot about that. Yep. He and did at that, say that moment, he thought his government was going to move into Kiev. It was going to fall. There was there were Russian soldiers making dinner reservations in Kiev during the invasion in really? the city, thinking they were going to take it over, and then they were just going to be able to like sit down. They had parade uniforms stacked in their in their trucks and their cars. They they were ready for what they thought was going to be a quick war. That's Again. not what happened. Well, I, I knew they were ready for the quick. And quick once war. they once yeah. they hit that wall, then all of a sudden the conversation started to change about exactly what they were going to get and what the outcome was going to be and what exactly their motivations were. But at that moment, I think he showed his most honesty. And look, if we look at the record of Putin himself, he is somebody who violated the ceasefire with tech. Chechnya to invade. He invaded Georgia yeah. illegally. He's invaded Ukraine multiple times now illegally, violating agreements, saying he was well, training well, operators well, before invading. Can I pause you for one second? Sure. Invaded a company or company. Why did he say that? Invaded a country illegally. Mm-hmm. All invasions are illegal. With the, I, I, I don't understand that. That's that not terminology. Invaded not all invasions a country are illegal. illegally. I think is a little. It, bit depend, it depends on what legal standard language. you you, re, you respect. Because, for example, the intervention in Yugoslavia was called for by the UN president. Sure. And if you are UN signatory, so, signatory if you, so if the UN says it's fine, then it's not illegal to invade a country. Well, under the UN, if you're if you're buying by international law, then yes, that doesn't mean it's moral necessarily. But if we're, it depends on what international bodies you respect, right. and most nation states mm. respect the UN. 
I don't. <laughs> but yeah. that's just me. No, but but again, um, that's kind of getting to the side. I, I didn't. I, yeah, I didn't. I didn't want to um, interrupt you. Sorry, but I, I, I agree with you. I think uh, obviously Putin, in my opinion, is a criminal. I mean, can um, I give you just one example? Yeah, so he's did you see go the protests ahead, ahead. in Georgia, for mm -hmm. example? Did you see those protests against the NGO law that the government was trying to introduce? Oh, that would yeah, have all yeah, these yeah. NGOs yeah. that mm -hmm. register as foreign agents, right. so they get yes. a deeper ability to monitor these organizations mm -hmm. and yep. control these organizations. Well, at the time, there was a bunch of civil dissent against the government, which they think is too pro-Russia. And the Russian government responded to the protests. Its embassy account said, you know, we dealt with you guys once. We'll do it again if things get too out of hand. And that is their official accounts openly threatening to invade Georgia if the protests get a little bit too out of hand. Now, of course, that's a Twitter account. That's not yeah. Putin himself getting on TV and saying it. But... That is still an apparatus of the Russian state openly flirting with the idea of invading Georgia because their people protested against their own government's laws, which is completely but, within their right as Georgian citizens. Do I am of the belief that if something was to happen in Georgia that the Russians didn't like too much, they would perfectly be willing to invade but Georgia. But do you think they, they didn't invade Germany? Because right. that's what I see online all the time. It's like, well, tomorrow it's a better. Germany. Well, a better well, comment is not invade Germany. Germany for it to not be important. I think inva an invasion of Georgia again would be extremely yeah. important. Well, Germany well, or the uh, the I, Baltics. I, I agree with that. I, do, I can give you. I, do, I, do I can give you guys this quick. Of Moldova, which already yeah. has Russian troops illegally stationed inside of it. I think yeah. that would be important as well. Did, or however, are they are they, are they leasing a military base in are they leasing that military base in Moldova though? I don't know this. Are they really They do have military bases in Moldova, yes. That they are leasing legally. Not legally, Is illegally. It? Oh, they're oh it's illegal. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. No, I could also no get, government yeah. out of Russia recognizes Transnistria, which mm. is their breakaway. Right, right, right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes. I could also give you guys this example. So right now we have Sweden that wants to go into NATO. We have Finland that's applying to NATO. Mm -hmm. Are these countries just run by a bunch of idiots who for no, no reason want to go into NATO, or do they actually consider there to be a real threat of Russia being able to acquire territory? Because when you say Germany, that's a little too far. That's a little bit too down the line. I would say today Ukraine, okay. tomorrow uh, the Baltics. Um, that's what I would say is – uh-oh, now you got the avatar on – and I will use this opportunity, by the way, to ask everybody, yeah, make sure to sneed those super chats. We got a 1099 uh, super chat from Iceland, which I'm going to read later on. So be sure to keep sneeding those super chats. Also, if you want to support Sorry, the show. Sorry, my husband, my, my husband does not want to be on camera. And he no just problem at all. So I'm like, no problem at all. I have to turn my camera. I, it, it will be back on in a moment. My husband yes. does not before, want to be on camera. Before we keep so. going, before we keep going, patreon.com slash break the rules. Listen, you, break the rules is the only show right now that I personally personally find that has these kind of crossovers of people from different worlds together. So if you guys want to support the show, become a patron today, patreon.com slash break the rules. We're going to be having individual uh, like Patreon, patron only streams uh, on a monthly basis. And also for the $50 tier, I am going to help you guys create a podcast. If anybody out there wants to learn how to make a podcast, I am going to do that. Anyway, we are going back into this. Uh, keeps needing the super chats. And also, loveslens.com. That is my substack. I recently wrote an article called MAGA's Ukraine Delusion, how populist thoughtlessness regarding, the Ukra uh, regarding Ukraine mirrors Democrats ignoring the border until it's too late. So I'm trying to basically bridge the divide that's going on right now between what the Democrats and the Republicans uh, uh, consider to be top priorities, because honestly, I think both the border and what's going on in Ukraine right now are things that need to be taken care of. And right now it feels like the, pol the politics are so divided that either you're going to be in the camp of uh, one or the other. But anyway, with that... Yeah, and that's, yeah, what, yeah. that's unfortunate, though, Lev. And I think that this is a... Um, the Ukraine issue... You know, Dylan, I I'm pretty sure you and I disagree on, like, 90% of political issues, probably. <laughs> But again, I've massively respected what you've done in terms of your reporting in Ukraine. I, I didn't even know you were still there. Um, I leave mid-November for Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving and Christmas, you got to spend with family. Mm. Yeah. Oh. I, 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 however, I think it's it, it's so incredibly important what you are doing because nobody else is doing that. I'm, and I'm not trying to blow smoke up your ass. I'm just saying, like, sincerely, nobody else is fucking doing this. So um, I think that's and that's why I, I've deferred to you on so many points in this discussion, because, you know, better than I do. I'm not there. None of us are. And, and, and the fact that people talk about it so flippantly on social media, I spent a month looking into the history of Ukraine uh, two years ago now when the when the conflict started to make a video about it. Mm -hmm. That's not the same thing. 
you know, like me spending a month doing research. That's mm -hmm. not the same thing as being in Ukraine. So I, I, I really do respect yeah. that. And again, um, I appreciate it. To be, uh, I, to, I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Yeah, Dylan, you've got Thank balls you for of, doing your work. You've got balls, yeah, of, balls steel, of steel, my <laughs> friend, being able to uh, uh, do what you do. But at the same time, though, to be fair to uh, Aiden here, when it comes to these broader geopolitical questions, being on the ground, while it gives you access to a lot of things uh, we otherwise don't have access to, I'm not sure that that's something that's going to be able to be answered just through being on the ground. My contention, though, with what Aiden you're talking about as far as uh, mm -hmm. pulling out of any kind of support is... Mm -hmm. What exactly is standing in your way of uh, Dylan being correct about eventually uh, Russia being able to go from Ukraine? Not all, not in Germany, but let's say the Baltics and the places right now that are kind of getting ready for you know if shit hits the fan. I don't see the evidence. I don't see the evidence for it. I don't see the, I, I mean, now again, again, I'm removed, but I don't see any evidence that Russia is going for anything other than Ukraine. And I explained at the beginning well, why Putin's already been why, talking about going to these other places. He's displayed maps on Russian propaganda. TV. I've seen, I've this seen is, it. Yeah. It's, but it's Russian propaganda. I think that this is, is trying to, he's putting his dick on the table. That's what I think that's about. I don't think that's realistic. Why make that louder? Sound? Two, two years, two years can't take Ukraine. <laughs> you think he's going to, you think he's going to take yeah. Chechnya? You think he's going to take uh, Czechoslovakia? Wait, he already Czechia. has Chechnya. He Chechnia. already talked about it. Yeah. I meant Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I remember that. But Words no, here, here's hard. the thing, though. I um, think he's going to take gonna whatever we allow him to. I don't think he's going to do it. Well, he's going to take whatever so. we allow maybe, him to. Maybe. So, no, but that's just like basic uh, mm, basic stuff. Maybe. So, for example. I don't want this to become yeah. too much of a 2v1. No, no, it's fine. No, no. 2v1, me. It's fine. Okay. Don't put, don't, in the context of the dick on the table content. If there's. Comment. If there's no uh, force, if there's no force that goes against Russia, why wouldn't Russia acquire something by force otherwise? Do you see what I'm saying? Like that's that's kind of my whole thing here, where Russia I, is not going to keep going once it's why? stopped. But if it doesn't get stopped, then it's going to keep going. That's actually why? that would be my main question to Aiden, yeah, and I don't want to pile sure. on, but you said two be one's fine. Is you want to abolish NATO? If NATO is abolished, how yeah. is that anything other than an open door for the Russians to roll into Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, you think and all they these will? countries that would no longer be covered by collective defense? Well, you you think that do you think that's a realistic prediction? Absolutely, yes. I do not believe. That I think without right. collective defense, that these countries are, I mean, to put it lightly, boned. Well, they shouldn't have denuclearized, and that's. I'm not saying that. Like, I'm not blaming them for that. Well, but, Estonia. But, I don't think these countries ever really even. Did Estonia, yeah. Latvia, and Lithuania have some, a large some of them, some, of them did, so, mm. uh, some of the Eastern European countries did have nuclear armaments yeah. uh, that, including Ukraine, obviously, that were disarmed. I think they should have had their own armaments. I think that the entire idea of disarmament was ridiculous. Uh, for the same reason, I think that everyone should be able to own a, f a firearm in the United States. Now, does it leave them like open? A pistol, does it... though, and a nuke is like one could end the world. Yes. And one bad actor with a gun gets like a school yeah. shooting terrible, true, but true, it doesn't true. mean humanity cannot recover. True, true. I agree. But nuclear disarmament, or excuse me, nuclear arms does provide a, a real incentive for. A, a massive nation like Russia to not invade a country. I am really, really skeptical of the contention that Russia is is expansionist to the degree that you're describing. Are they expansionist? Yes. I think that's undeniable. But to the degree that you're describing, I don't think so. Because if they start invading, because you, Ukraine, like I said, has this really long um, shared history with Russia, and and there's also so a all lot. These other countries. Uh, yeah, they were all part of the Russian Empire. Estonia, Latvia, they, they, Lithuania. They, yes, not they only, were part of the, not right, only yes, have a history no, under the Russian Empire, they also have Russian-speaking populations. They that do. The Russian as government Ukraine. has talked about liberating. I, I really find it difficult to believe that Russia would invade Latvia, or Lithuania. I just find that difficult to believe. What I could be if look if I'm proven without, wrong without I'm, collective defense. What stops? Oh shit on me. Uh, because well, I you know what? I guess that's correct. Um, because the entire world would react to it. <laughs> I don't think uh, so. I, look at what we're trying to. I'm saying. I'm saying. No, I'm saying you're right. I'm saying you're right. The entire world would react to it in a way they haven't. That 
they've sort of reacted to you. I don't think they would, though. Look at the treaties really? before World War II that guaranteed protection of for Poland I, well, before even though, Nazi Germany I, invaded. I don't think NATO should exist. I, I'm, I'm just saying these the treaties end. these treaties aren't worth the paper they're printed on. None of these treaties maybe, matter, maybe, in my maybe. opinion. Yeah, which yeah, is yeah. why, like, when we're saying, like, well, why wouldn't, why would they invade? Why wouldn't they mm. invade? That's the thing. Because oh, Lev, I disagree with you. Okay. Go I, on. I mean, I think Article Five has has so far been respected, and I think that it, the Russians have good reason to believe that if they were to actually try to invade Estonia, that NATO would then declare war on Russia, and then Russia would not win that war. Um, I mean, the world not the lose. entire world was against the Russians. There's no way that the Russians would end up winning it, um, depending on how mm. the war went. Whether like, but there's no scenario where the Russians take Berlin at the end of that war. Uh, that, at least in their current state, at least in the current state with the current allies, they have shown themselves to be unable to do that. But I, I, what my main point is, is if we are to go through with the libertarian monarchist dream and we make, I don't know, um, <laughs> like That's Guy true. Fieri King or whoever it would be, whoever would be the libertarian Trump. icon. Trump. Uh, Trump. Obviously Trump. Trump. Would, make Trump would, king. Would, <laughs> make Trump king. Can Got we just him make perfect. him like... Can we make him Funhouse King? I like his jokes. Yeah, let's really go. Good. Let's Can we just make him Funhouse, Funhouse King? King? Let's go. Let's go with Funhouse Like, how King. about we have to, to, to take the country, let's unite the country, Biden can be king, king and Trump can be press secretary. And then, and oh then they can God, argue. Oh, my God, that would be insane. Uh, talk about the odd couple. <laughs> but, but my point is, is if NATO was gone, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, these are countries that are of a few million people. Yeah, I small. mean, they're much smaller than Ukraine. They have less people to throw into the Russian lines. Less money, less Russia military. has talked about the Russian-speaking peoples of them, and not only them, they've talked about it in Kazakhstan as well in reference yep. to possible disruptions that could happen there. Uh, and without an army to come meet them, what disincentive would they have from invading and conquering these countries well, well, if we were to abolish they... NATO tomorrow? I'll ask you the opposite question. What incentive do they have? I, I, I don't like to, like... The we'll same reason the that they have for invading Ukraine. They want to build an empire, which the Russians are very open about. I suppose that's true. I mean, like, I, and they have been open about that, or at least Putin has. Um, however, it, it does totally, it, it totally and completely destroys the reputation of Russia in, in, in the global mindset, except with China, except for with China. They don't seem to it's care. It's already destroyed. They didn't stop them from invading Ukraine, I know. though, did it? That, so again, they, well, but wouldn't it make it? I know, but wouldn't it make it worse if they then keep invading other sovereign nations? All right, nations? here's here's another thing, which uh, I don't know, uh, Dylan, if you know this, but this is just more of a well, personal. Can I just situation. say one thing to that, sure. Love? Sure. I just wanted to say one thing to that. Sure. Is it would make their image worse, but unless there's a force to meet them, they've shown themselves to not really care about how they're viewed internationally, whether it be Bucha or whether it be uh, the husband, uh, the recent killing of one out of every six people in oh, the village yeah. around out of Kupyansk. I heard about like, that. They, yeah. They barely they didn't even talk about it. They just pretend it didn't happen right. as these, Th that's these typical war, reports though. are coming out. As people, the stuff that scares me the most always of those videos are the phones where you can hear as the as the oh, rescue God. workers going through, like the phones going off on the bodies because the family members are trying to call them. And hearing that from inside the body bag is unbelievably horrific. Those images are broadcast <sighs> around the world. Russia doesn't care. And so I don't think unless there was a strong force to meet them that the Russians are going to get like a like a splash of compassion or like a splash of regret because the French foreign minister said, we don't like that very much unless there's something mm. to meet them. Mm. I think that's why they yeah. invaded Ukraine because there was no NATO in Ukraine and there was no one to meet them. Oh, oh no, oh. you're absolutely right. That's why they invaded Ukraine because there was no NATO. Yeah. 100%. They would never have invaded uh, Ukraine if, if they were a part of NATO. Absolutely. Or if they had Whoever, the other country, The other country you're talking about are a part of NATO. And that's why I think that it's a little bit silly to say that they're just going to just start invading yeah, NATO countries. Yeah, but you're countries. advocating for a system where NATO's gone. And so I'm asking, it, like, what can we replace <laughs> it with that would not nukes. increase the risk of nuclear disaster while nukes. also preserving their sovereignty? Unfortunately, nukes is the answer. Uh, I, I don't uh, like NATO for a, a variety of reasons. And I, I, the reason why Ukraine was, from my understanding, denied as consistently since the 90s been denied access into nato is because they're considered to be too corrupt as a nation and, and you can you could um tell me if i'm incorrect about that dylan 
because that's from my understanding why Ukraine has not been accepted into NATO. It's because of the, the political corruption within the nation. I, I think uh, that's more came into play when it comes to the EU. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that's oh, the EU. Why they're holding yeah. them back from integration mm -hmm. with the rest of Europe. It's something they're trying to work on a lot more now as the process is speeding up. Also, the border regions, when it comes to Russia's meddling within those regions, that was also a thorn on the side of the uh, uh, of, U of Ukraine when it comes to uh, gaining entrance into NATO. And in a way, I think that's why Putin mm -hmm. for a long time didn't even invade those areas. He was like, you know what, let's keep Ukraine occupied by all these thorns on its side so that it's not going to be able to get into NATO. But I did want to say one personal thing when it comes to the mentality that I find like people who I know who are still in Russia, like uh, from my father's side, for instance... Uh, um, oh, right. what uh, yeah. what they see what they seem to be like in terms of their mentality is when there's not a lot of food when the economy's not really good they start focusing on hey why do we have this horrible government that's in charge of you know where the tax money goes but then as soon as russia starts to it's funny like as soon as russia starts to go and like invade and acquire some territory mm -hmm. like with uh, crimea for example ukraine's the bread their basket whole, of your their whole well their whole mindset changes and then they're like rah 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 you know let's invade this country because unfortunately a lot of russian mentality and this is just something i find i know dylan if you would agree or not has to do with they feel like they want things to be worse for the people who are around them, for their neighbors, even if they're also going to be worse off. There is kind of like this unfortunate, vengeful thing that happens. So when Putin, for oh. example, goes to invading, you know, one territory or another territory, it gets Which people's minds. That? It gets people's minds off the fact yeah. that they're poor, that they're starving, that they have just like outhouses. You know, in most of uh, Russia, they don't even have proper plumbing. They forget about that because they go into a different mindset. Which is why I think Putin's going to keep going not even for himself yeah. but more so because the people in a way need for russia to keep going to get their mind off the horrible problems that are going on in russia except for like I moscow and st petersburg i think you're 100 percent correct on that love is that this is a distraction for average everyday russians who are suffering in their own way to uh, externalize that to to be like oh well you know uh, yeah i don't have a toilet that has running water but we're winning as Russia. I think that's absolutely correct. Um, I don't think that legitimizes or delegitimizes, legitimizes or delegitimizes the entire conflict. Um, I've explained- well, Can I ask you, what, what do you think legitimizes Russia's conflict if there is anything? Um, their historical claims over Kiev, uh, which I don't think is necessarily correct. You think I that think, they're- No, I, I'm, well, not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not saying it actually, excuse me. It's not a legitimate claim, but what legitimizes it to Russians is the historical claim to Kiev, is the historical claim that Ukraine is Russia. That to to Russians, I believe, is what legitimizes it to them. In terms of what legitimizes it on an international scale, I would say it's probably about Biden's, honestly, involvement, whatever you think it is, small or big, whatever the involvement is. I think that the, the reason people outside of Russia look at why they're invading Ukraine. They see Ukraine as a proxy puppet state of the United States and that it is owned by Joe Biden and his regime, which I've said on Twitter. Uh, and I, 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 I really have a hard time dismissing that as a legitimate claim because I do think there's a lot of weird stuff that's happened there. We've talked about it um, earlier in this conversation, but I think that Joe Biden has a very weird kind of interaction with Ukraine uh, that doesn't make any sense considering he's not Ukrainian and yet his involvement both with his son and with the stuff with the prosecutor, uh, Victor Shokin, is weird. I don't know if it's definitive. I'm not claiming to, it to be definitive. I'm just saying it looks weird from an observer perspective. I I would so I would say when it comes to the claims that Russia was making, Russia was not making those claims six years like like six years mm -hmm. before they invaded in 2014. That mm -hmm. the Russian government Vladimir Putin was openly saying yep. there's no ethnic conflict, there's no yep. problem. And then once he saw an opportunity, he completely turned around his position and invaded. So I would yes. say that if it was legitimate, it was a legitimate concern or it had some like legitimate territorial claims. How did they just randomly manifest in a six-year time period? It was used post facto. Oh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not defending. Um, okay, hang on. So I'm not defending uh, 
Putin invading Crimea in 2014. Okay. Any any excuse was that about the United States' involvement was made post facto, and that was post facto of the Euromaidan. Now, the, and the Victoria Newland call and um, Olga uh, Bologometz, whose name I always fuck up, and all that kind of weird stuff that happened in 2014. That was two years later in Ukraine. So I I don't obviously Putin's like no hero in this. He's not correct. He was obviously using this to facilitate and to put forward his own political agenda, which was to conquer Ukraine. That's unquestionable. Mm -hmm. But is there corruption in Ukraine that was facilitated I, and, I, and conducted by the U.S. government? I think that's also unquestionable. I Corruption facilitated by the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. The thing is, what, what gets me about that is the United States has invested a lot more into anti-corruption efforts in Ukraine um, than a about lot those? of Ukraine's allies. Um, yeah, no, genuinely. Um, okay, I so don't under what what confuses me is one of the main sticking points for the American state when mm -hmm. it comes to aid for Ukraine. And we're getting memos that are leaking now about this. We're not leaking. They're posting them, but they're posting it without fanfare, kind of like hoping nobody really reads it. They're openly saying that one of the main uh, concerns from the Americans is corruption in Ukraine, that they're concerned that any amount of aid or stuff that could be sent over could be corruptedly maybe absorbed by some oligarch. And I think a lot of times I've imagined like we said, but, but we and know there are, but but corruption there in Ukraine is a lot more simple than that. What was that? We know that we know there's oligarchs in Ukraine who who do corrupt shit. Well, yeah, I was I was gonna say there, there is corruption in Ukraine, but corruption is a lot more simple Sorry. than I would think a lot of people realize. A lot of it is government see government man sees contract. They remember they have a friend who mm -hmm. makes this sort of thing. They give this contract to their friend. They get a kickback. That's how most Ukrainian corruption is styled around. And so my concerns around Ukrainian corruption, corruption has to do with rebuilding efforts has to, and has to do with humanitarian assistance, which I know that some of it has been taken and resolved. The military aid, which I think is the main thing we're debating, but we can debate the humanitarian aid as well, that we have yet to see any large scale corruption out of that. And from my personal experience, most I've heard is like a box of grenades goes missing here, a box of AKs goes missing there. Maybe it ends up with like maybe some small gang or Let, ends up somewhere on some but market. Let's but talk about we're talking about the large scale aid that makes up the majority of our military contributions. It's that I, I have yet to see any real evidence let, of. Let's talk so, about wait, let me, let me, I have a Go cherry ahead, on top. Sorry. This is the whole point I was leading up to. Okay. My my main point here is to say it doesn't make sense that Joe Biden would be supporting Ukraine in order to corruptly benefit himself or his son because of the Victor, Victor Shokin thing, which was a different administration. It wasn't Zelensky. Zelensky no. ran against Petro Poroshenko. So I don't even know how that influence would would come over. The new uh, call Petro is where people think it, it, it where people do. Call? I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that 100 well, percent. But I'm saying that show I'm anything. Saying that's where the contention comes into, and it's where, where people think the connection comes in. But I feel so. like the phone call shows the exact opposite of corruption. The phone call shows that the American government wanted the protesters to make a deal with Yanukovych, and they didn't, showing that America wasn't really able but to Arsene control Yatsenyuk what the Ukrainian was people elected, were doing. was he not? Yatsenyuk was elected, yes, but it was out of a small list of people who, well, he wasn't elected, he was appointed, appointed and then somebody yes. else was elected. Yes, 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 he was Nazi appointed. Yoke, yeah, right, Petro right. Portenko, was Petro who Portenko. also yep, yep. happened right, to be right. this, a same member of the political party of Yanukovych, the person who fled. Why would America appoint somebody from the same party of the guy who was just killing protesters if they were the ones in control? Why would they have well, if encouraged America was, the protesters was the one to make a deal the with the government? Why would they encourage these protesters to make a deal with the government if they would then, those protesters would do the exact opposite Wait, of what the American Aiden, wanted? Aiden, please repeat what you control? said. I think that got lost. If, it, it, yeah. if the American government was the one killing the protesters, then yeah, I would imagine they, they probably did have a vested interest because that is the connection of Olga Bologometz, is that it was the American government killing the protesters. In the year of my dawn. Now, okay, well, you, you, I, don't, you don't believe her. Well, yeah, I, I think that she's, she, she's a um, a dermatologist, but uh, she <laughs> wait. She, why would I? Why would I even listen to what a dermatologist has to say about this? <laughs> oh no, the poor I'm, dermatologist. I'm, I, no, why? Well, why did I tell you that? Because obviously, I was saying I'm trying to be clear, but Just like I, I don't, I don't know the truth. 
Yeah, because I don't know the truth. But people but, contend everything. People contend the moon landing is fake. People contend that like George Bush did 9-11. I don't 9/11. think this is the same people thing. People contend a whole sort. Well, that thing, the American government killed the protesters. I do that think, is I, George I do Bush think George did Bush did 9-11. I conspiracy. think George Bush did 9-11. That's my personal opinion. But anyway, <laughs> um, sorry, it's a totally different thing. But um, is there any evidence outside of this dermatologist that we no. killed those protesters? She, so she why would I one, care what a dermatologist has to say? She was in the Ukrainian government. Okay, I know there's a lot of former politicians who talk about aliens that they saw yeah, while in I, office. I'm, 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 that's, and money. Well, I'm just telling the answer to that. I don't know. Uh, I I don't actually really necessarily believe Olga Bologometz either, but that's her contention. Is that so why did the we United, bring it up? Because she says that you the United States killed people with Euromaidan, and she said it with no evidence. She if I if, I if I said in this room. That she, Vladimir did you Putin examine the bodies? Did if you I said in here that Vladimir Putin was the real person who killed George Floyd, and I said, look, I'm an American reporter in Ukraine. I know stuff about Vladimir Putin. Like, that certainly is at least more of a claim than a dermatologist. But unless you I have evidence to back it up, it's just a bodies. wild, bizarre claim. She examined the bodies, and she said that she thought that NATO did it. What? Was it, did she post photos to prove it? Like I don't how, know. How would you even no, by looking didn't, at the she bodies? Didn't, she didn't how post would you even prove that she, she, she was the Would it be the bullet casings? The bullet casings yes, that were yes, matched that was her guns claim. used that by was the her police claim. department? That was, her, that was exactly her claim, Dylan, was that she, she examined lied. the bullet casings and she said that they had the, the excuse me, handwriting of being from NATO. I don't know what the fuck she meant by that, honestly. I really Did she don't. have any pictures of that handwriting? She didn't post it. No, you're right. That's very convenient. But that's her contention. And we know that the Russian government constantly sponsors misinformation campaigns and so somebody who's a former politician long no longer in office i don't think you're necessarily wrong with claims that they don't have evidence in and no expertise to speak on has all the signs of a russian disinformation campaign something that should be on, honestly dismissed out of hand unless there's evidence to back it up because I, I there's evidence that's contrary to it i don't necessarily disagree with you on that i think you're probably well but there's also not evidence against it. So th this extremely high ranking official in Ukraine. So if we're going to to treat Ukrainian okay, let's let's start out from this perspective. We know that Ukrainian politics is corrupt deep down, right? We all yeah. know this. Is Olga Bologometz a corrupt official because she is a publicly elected official for the Ukrainian government in mm -hmm. 2014? I don't not necessarily. know. Maybe, but maybe, but maybe not. I don't know. Again, you don't know, and I don't know. And and no, she did not post photos, but she said that she thought it was NATO who killed those people in in. Can I ask you what party is she a member of? Let's find out. I don't know. Okay, I. I, I just, what? I just feels like, mm -hmm. like this is how she just made a claim, and there's no evidence of the claim. There's no photos of this writing. She just claimed it had this writing, she even though. <clears throat> The Honored investigators doctor. who did the investigation say the exact opposite, and those would be people who know how to do ballistics testing, know, like, could try to match the bullets to the uh, guns used by the police force, which they did do. So, like, this is just the claims of a former person okay. who used to be I'm a gonna read. A I'm going to read her, her, her Wikipedia description. Okay. is uh, Olga Vadimovna Bogomolets. As a Ukrainian physician, singer, and songwriter, honored doctor of Ukraine, the founder and chief doctor of the Institute of Dermatology and Cosmetology. In 2014, she was appointed as a counselor on humanitarian issues to the president of Ukraine. She is also a former MP and former chairman of the committee of, Verkovna, of the Verkovna Rada on health issues. Um, that's all it says about her background. She so was appointed I, by Poroshenko, but as far as what It would have been Poroshenko. Yeah. Yes. It would have been so because she was appointed by Poroshenko, it would have been his party, I assume. Got because you. So it'd be yeah. it'd be the same party of Yanukovych yes. then. Yes. Got you. Okay. So presumably, if uh, now the idea that well, there's no evidence for it, but there's no evidence against it. This we could use to make any number of outlandish claims, right? I mean, I could use it to be like, well, actually, I think it was the Russians who did 9/11. You know, I think it was actually <laughs> them. I don't have any yeah, evidence true, for it, true. but I don't got any evidence against it. And mm -hmm. then who knows who's paying me to say that to try to drum up support party, for intervention in Ukraine. I'm like, I'm using that. Hey, Americans, they killed a bunch of us on 9-11. We need to go get revenge against the Russians. And I could be doing that because I'm paid by the Ukrainian government. 
or I'm paid by some actor that wants the Ukrainian government to give this aid. By the way, I do think she might have been paid. All I'm saying is, if we're going to make such a a, a gigantic statement that's against the grain of what the vast majority of evidence has proven and have no evidence to back it up, I'm going to definitely, when it's somebody who doesn't have an expertise on the issue at hand, I am going to dismiss it out of hand. Okay, I don't think that's... uh... I, I, I brought uh, up Olga because that's the evidence I have. Um, I don't actually think that you're incorrect. I don't necessarily trust her fucking reporting either because it's one woman. However, necessarily putting her academic credentials on the line, she is, however, a cosmetologist. You know, I could have lied so much about this. You know how much I could have lied and I appreciate bullshitted. you not lying about it. <laughs> but, no, no, well, because I, I, I don't know the answer to these questions. So I could I could have been like, oh, a doctor said that. No, yes, she's a doctor, but she's also a cosmetologist. <laughs> so, and that's what she said is that she said that she thought it was it bore the handwriting. That's her words, handwriting. That I don't know what that me. means either. I don't know what that means what either. What does that I don't mean? Know what like NATO was means. here? It was like they signed the shell with like like I don't know. Biden signed each bullet. Like this is for <laughs> showing my Joe this, Biden. <laughs> this is for my boy Hunter. More coke for me. Like I, I don't know. <laughs> Dylan, I but don't this, know. This that's her, if, if that's it was a her CIA statement. Op, right? If it was a CIA op, I feel like the CIA, being one of the most powerful intelligence agencies in the world, has a pretty <laughs> extensive stockpile of old Soviet munitions for this exact Probably. assassination it's purpose. Assassinate and I don't know why somebody, they wouldn't right? use those old stockpile or send those bullets over, which Very is weird. the same bullets used by the Burkut police, Very which would weird. match. It would make sense. I don't know why Olga said this. I only know what she said. That's what I'm going off of. I also mm. find other things about the entire Euromaidan incident weird. Uh, for example, there was a, an ad that was aired internationally. It was put on YouTube. It's from, ooh, hang on. Um, Whisper to a Roar is the name of the campaign. But it, they did this ad called I Am the Ukrainian, and it was about the Euromaidan protests. Mm-hmm. And that was funded by George Soros indirectly. And okay. so I'm not saying that means anything either also necessarily, but there was weird stuff that appeared to be that there were international interests that were concerned or in some way involved in the Euromaidan do you, protests. I, I feel like, you know, if we were to do this with any sort of protest, for example, let's say there was a Black Lives Matter protest mm-hmm. in the United States tomorrow and somehow it spiraled out into into some point it became very politically important for whatever yeah. reason say violence mm-hmm. happened or a cop ended up shooting some protester and it spiraled out and it led to the local politics changing drastically cuz people reacted to what happened i'm sure if i go and i look through all the different organizations or ngos that could have either been having medics on the ground that could have been uh funding ads in favor of like black empowerment or whatever sure i could find some number of ngos that people don't know all the funders of or maybe even the open society foundation could have been involved in something like that but that doesn't necessarily mean that anybody was puppeteering these protesters from the background and making them go out and provoke the police they were specifically funding uh, social media programs in order to get people to post videos online about the year on my dawn that was the exact purpose of it I find that okay. a little bit, I, again, I find it a little bit weird. I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know why it was happening. But I do find it a little bit odd that the United States indirectly, and it wasn't just, uh, Whisper to War was also uh, funded by the United States indirectly. Mm-hmm. I find that a little bit odd. And this isn't Was that the National Endowment for Democracy? Yes, that was it. You got it. Oh, I forgot it. And you remembered it. Um, I believe it was a national endowment for democracy. There was also another organization that was a like another similar thing where it was um, spreading democracy organization. Mm. Um, and yeah, they 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 financed these tech camps in Ukraine that started about six months before the year of my dawn. Mm. And that's it. Just again, I don't know. No one knows the exact relationship, but it's kind of suspicious, in my opinion. I mean, I think that it shows evidence that the American government was interested in helping to build up an active civil society in Ukraine. People who were either citizen journalists, people who were interested in anti-corruption efforts. That's what I was talking about earlier, us funding anti-corruption efforts or any number of issues. And the reason being 
if you're going to root out corruption, that has to come through the grassroots. Mm. If you want to sure. move on any one number of these issues, it can't just be Western bureaucrats walking into Ukraine saying, deal with the corruption. <laughs> it has to come from somewhere. True. And they wanted to empower those people on the ground. Now, whether or not you believe that's the role of the state, I don't necessarily think that indicates that we were able to, through just some social media posts, inspire oh, no. the rage I, that led to the yeah. Yanukovych regime crumbling. The same way that anybody that's like saying that's not that, my contention, dude. That's I insane. I no, been insane say, contention. It would be like somebody saying that Putin elected Donald Trump. Is it true yeah. that the Internet Research Agency obviously spread misinformation in order to try to benefit one candidate over the other? Yeah, but if you were to say that means Donald Trump is not legitimate or he's not, he wasn't truly elected, yeah. I, I don't think that would be accurate either. And that I was agree. shady backroom, like Internet Research Agency, just trying to keep that hidden. This was through the National Endowment of Democracy, which is congressionally funded, and those pu those funds are open and in the public eye. That's the reason why we can access them. Uh, right. So I, I I do think that you can have an objection for this for us trying to fund that civil society, but I don't think that indicates that we were like the backroom mm. like puppeteers in the background. And this the thing that really frustrates me a lot about the Euromaidan theories is like it's always like. Well, isn't that kind of sus, or isn't that kind of weird? And there's nothing oh, I can like grab just onto. Sus, right? There's nothing I can like grab onto and be like, "Wow, here's like a smoking gun. Here's some evidence." Because it's really easy for me to believe, especially talking to people who participate in Euromaidan. I've interviewed soldiers who participated, I'm activists sure who have. participated. Um, awesome. Is that they that they say that they would have done Euromaidan with or without the United States after the police started murdering protesters and which they were. them with batons and Un I think that it's really easy to understand why somebody would do that. I feel like this is an exact this is a a case where the easiest explanation is the best explanation. Well, Dylan, to be fair to Aiden, we could imagine that there were people who are on the ground there who represent various NGOs who want to oh, make absolutely. money. I don't think that everybody's just a bunch of freedom-loving Boy Scouts that are in charge of a lot of these programs. And I also find, like with Zelensky, for example, uh, I wrote an article about this, how he seems to have been really appealing to more, let's say, you know, woke, for lack of a better term, causes when it comes to, for example, Ukraine sort got of. the uh, transgender individual to represent their armed forces until the uh, recent firing, uh, having uh, Greta Thunberg Actually, come in. Actually, they were, they were not fired. Uh, she follows me on Twitter, Ashton. Okay. Uh, she, was, she was suspended, suspended, and I think they might be reinstituting her, mm. uh, but she was suspended Curious. briefly. Interesting. But you see my point, though, like when it comes to certain issues that, let's say, I could imagine NGOs would think, oh, this would appeal to certain, let's say, more liberal left leaning Americans. So there would be certain things, certain people that we would encourage. And there is the question of, you know, how far would that go and yada, yada, yada. But all I'm saying is that people do have other uh, reasons for doing things other than just wanting to free Ukraine. My whole contention, though, is how would that compare to the other things that we have going on as far as Russia invading Ukraine right now and being able to then potentially invade other places down the line? That's much more of a concern than any of this other stuff. I do think those those NGOs profiteering or having extremely high overhead costs when you go in there and you read exactly how much of the money is actually spent on aid or building a civil society and how much of it actually goes to the people who manage it and giving them very big checks and, you know, staffing costs. Um, but I, I, I also I do want to say that, again, I, I do think that they might not be 100 percent well intentioned in every single example of all these NGOs, but I think there's it's a far cry from the claims that are being made about the Euromaidan revolution. Uh, mm. There's one thing to be said about America giving money to an NGO that profiteered and cared more about making, filling the pockets of themselves than actually dealing with the stuff on the ground, which I would have to listen to which NGO we're talking about because some do good work, some do bad work. Yep. You should always do research into these things. But I, I think it's a far cry from the idea that, and this is what is popularly pushed, that America was puppeteering the protest from a distance by using NGO money when the protesters were not listening oh, to the oh, United States. I don't think that's accurate. That uh, that, and, the, and that's not the contention I'm making, by the way, yeah. that the U.S. somehow completely puppeteered and created the Euromaidan. I think the U.S. was interested in the Euromaidan and yeah, the protests. I think, I think that's un, pretty much unquestionable that the U.S. was interested and involved in the Euromaidan. I don't think they puppeteered it. And I think anyone who's I'm sorry. If that's your claim, it's a little bit silly. That's too conspiratorial even for me. Um, <laughs> that's probably not what's happening. The United States, of course, has a vested interest in Ukraine, though. I think we can all admit that, right? Yeah. 
the United States has a vested interest in Ukraine. Uh, particularly Joe Biden, as vice president at the time, had a vested interest in Ukraine um, because his son was serving on the board of a energy company um, in Ukraine. But Joe Biden showed up at least once, but maybe I think twice at the Euromaidan protests himself in person to, to give support to the protests. I'm sorry, but it's difficult for me to imagine that there is no involvement in Joe Biden's family. And I, I would call it the Joe Biden crime syndicate, but that's my personal um, uh, terminology there. Wait, can it, I ask it, you? Sure. When this year my was happening, because... 2014. Yeah, it was, well, it was late 2013, early 2014. Yep, yep, yep. Hunter Biden joined the board of Burisma in 2014. Was that after yes. or before the Euromaidan protests? I actually think Hunter joined after the Euromaidan. So, so how could that be a motivating factor for Joe Biden if he wasn't even on the board yet? Well, you're not seeing like the setup, right? Joe Biden comes and supports the Euromaidan and then his son ends up on the board of Burisma. So you would say that Burisma was not looking out for its own interests. It was serving some type of nationalist Ukrainian interests. Uh, at the time, no, the Burisma wasn't doing anything. Uh, again, to I just, I just don't know why at... Burisma would particularly be interested in, like, we're going to get involved in Euromaidan well, and trying to make Joe I, Biden. I, I, I didn't it. say Burisma was involved in Euromaidan whatsoever. They weren't, as far as I know. So why would that at all be tied to Joe Biden, the Euromaidan protest, then? Because Joe Biden showed up. I believe twice to give speeches at the Euromaidan. But this was in relations to the Burisma thing, wasn't it? And then six months later or whatever, his son ends up on the board of the major, the biggest Ukrainian energy company. You but again, no, but I'm asking you, you what that would be weird. the motivation? Well, my, it's weird that he's on the board and I can say it's weird, but that doesn't mean that Burisma was, I think Burisma was looking out for its profit. I don't think Burisma, because it's a company, that's what companies mm -hmm. do. But I don't think Burisma was particularly interested in using Hunter Biden to be like, uh, like to say, Bakto Nash Bandera, we're going to bring about the Ukrainian state. I think they were mostly interested in that's trying to about, benefit I'm their not going to talk about Bandera because that's that's like a whole fucking road I don't want to go down. Because yeah, you, no you know where that leads, that. by my, the way. My point is, I just don't think that, I don't think Burisma would have stuck its neck out for Ukraine's like, quote unquote, freedom or Euromaidan, I do think they stick their, out, their neck out for profit. So I just don't see the connection between well, I, Euromaidan I and and this. Uh, let me try to re-elaborate. Re Joe Biden shows up, I think, twice, but definitely once. I know once 100%, not just Joe Biden, by the way, a whole bunch of other American politicians show up to show their support for the Euromaidan, right? John McCain. Yes, exactly. John McCain shows up uh, to, to uh, show their support for the Euromaidan. I believe six months later, or about in that kind of time span, Joe Biden's son and his best friend get elected to these CEO, or these, not CEO, but these, these high positions within a Ukrainian energy company in which neither of them have any qualifications to serve in. And we have seen all the emails about why they were elected and uh, into that position, and also that it seemingly was for the purpose of having Joe Biden to um, espouse them, and, and and for Joe Biden to talk about it. It Wait, was just about Joe, they were selling here. Joe Biden's influence. I'm looking here. Did Biden go to Euromaidan? Because I'm looking, yes, and it, uh, everything I'm finding he, is. Oh, Mike, are you joking? He did. Ugh! I'm looking at the stuff here. Everything oh, I look up, God. Joe Biden visits your Maidan is him v visiting Maidan after the anniversary of the protest. No, no, no. He went during the protests. I, oh, I have to find this. Okay, hang on. I have to look through my And everybody, if you're enjoying it. It's a genuine question because I just yeah. don't remember him. I know John yeah, McCain did, visited, though. I don't remember John, specifically John him McCain visiting. did, but so did Joe Biden. And if you're enjoying the there show, go. be sure okay, to uh, put a like on. Is it in 2014 in February? There it is. Okay, yep, everything was funny about is. the anniversary. I don't. I'm really not ever trying to lie. If I'm wrong, I'll okay, tell well, you no, I'm wrong. <laughs> well, you talked about the sniper thing earlier, so I was just like, I just but, and, to, and I and I and I agree with you that well, I'm I just know the answer. and people get things wrong, like the Trinistra thing. I was just asking. I just because I didn't remember. I think I've been extremely open about things that I'm not sure about, but things I am sure about. I'm that's why I asked. Ask, you're, that's fine, all. you're fine. You're fine. You're fine. Yeah, no, we're cool. I, again, I I can see if if the pattern was Joe Biden goes to Ukraine 
and then it negotiates some gas deal or negotiates something that would benefit Burisma in some way. Which did. Which what did. did he? What deal did he negotiate with Burisma? It, the, the the whole freaking uh, wait a minute. I have to pull this up. Okay, uh, Biden. Mm -hmm. Biden helped negotiate a, a, an enormous uh, gas deal with uh, with Russia and Ukraine and the United States about with Russia energy. and Ukraine. You mean between Russia and Ukraine, or you mean between Ukraine and the United States? Oh, it's going to take me a minute. Um, there was a huge gas deal that he helped. Um... Hang on. Yeah. And Jerry Mack, the Ukrainian lore master, writes, Biden was never on Maidan here during the protests. He lives in Ukraine, by the way. He says New Newland was. Oh, and by the way, somebody wrote over here, Endless Had wrote, poor host can't plug the stream. Feel you, bro. So I'm going to plug Can it I... right now. Yes. I'm everybody. not wrong with that, actually. actually you know, you know, wait, wait, hold on. First, smash, smash the like button, damn it. Do it right now. Can, we got to get go more likes. Let's, yeah, let's I want to use the bathroom really keep, bad. Keep I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. I agree. Same thing. Right back. Okay, while you guys are here, Listen, guys, go to breaktherules.tv right now. All the people who are watching this on uh, Dylan's Twitch or wherever you guys are watching it, go to breaktherules.tv, subscribe to YouTube, and listen, Break the Rules is the number one show on YouTube which brings everybody together, insiders along with outsiders. Some frequent guests include uh, Mensha Smoldbug, a.k.a. Curtis Yarvin, also talking about Ukraine with uh, my friend Vladislav Davidson, who is a member of the Atlantic Council, by the way, Sticks Hex and Hammer. 666 regular guest we also have uber boyo jason Giorgiani, meme analysis we got it all we got some of the greatest guests you are ever going to experience high level conversations and most importantly we do the kind of crossovers nobody ever else does bring the people who are on the more let's say extreme side of the internet more of the very online community together with people who are part of these various think tanks nobody's done that before so that's why it's very important for you guys to support the show become a patron today patreon.com slash break the rules i can't emphasize enough how patronage helps same thing with the super chat and lastly but not leastly levslens.com if you join my Substack right now, especially for all of you pro-Ukraine people, I don't think you're going to be disappointed. I write a lot of articles about Ukraine on the Substack, as well as trying to bridge the connection between more of the uh, populist types and what's going on with Ukraine right now. So be sure to check that out. Although the next article may be about migration. I don't know. There's this thing I found about how um, China, China is apparently China. funding some of the uh, <laughs> housing of the migrants in New York City as uh, in their um, bank statements there that I found online. So interesting stuff. Anyway, let us get back to the conversation. And one thing I would definitely want to focus on is, again, uh -huh. with uh, Aiden, what you were bringing up about uh, if only these countries had nukes. The only problem is, like, dealing with the situation we're in right now, what are the realistic options we got dealing with this situation because sure. I don't think we'll be able to give nukes to the countries right now. So it's like working with what we got, how do we stop the worst thing from happening? Go. Uh, but yeah. before I get into that, I would before, okay. want, want to complete a previous yes. thought that I didn't have the citation on, but I now have it. It was that it. there was uh, 40, 400 million, the 800 million that was invested in the people of Ukraine, 400 million in economic growth, 1.1 billion um, in well, that was economic growth. Sorry. Let me rephrase. Governing and just governing justly and democratically, the United States gave eight hundred billion to investing the people, four hundred million economic growth, one point one billion, and humanitarian assistance, three hundred million. That was the the thing. But I, I gotta say, Dylan, I I really can't find the thing that I was talking about with, with Hunter Biden. So you might be correct on that. I I couldn't find the easily find the citation on what I said there. So I may be incorrect okay, about that. If you that. find it after, you can just send it to me. Nah, it's fine. I'm probably fucking wrong. <laughs> um, anywho, I'm pretty sure I'm By right, the way, but I might I be wrong. I looked up the Biden thing. So he wasn't mm -hmm. at Yeramidon. He met with politicians in- uh, Yes, uh, including Oleg Tel Honeybook. Yes. He made, he, he did a, uh, he, no, he, he also did a speech. He also did a speech. Um, look it up. I, I I swear to God, I'm not wrong on this one. Okay, um, he, he, did, he did a speech. I know he did a speech on the anniversary, but I can look it up. Was it was it the um, anniversary then? And maybe I'm wrong about that one. Might have but been. I know for a fact he gave a speech in Ukraine. 
You're I'm my daughter. sorry, Lev, could you restate your question to me? Because I'm um, absolutely. A big and then we're gonna go and then we're gonna go to super chat. So everybody sneed those super chats. And sneed. there are not and there are not enough likes. Look, there's hundred and eleven people watching. I bet there aren't hundred and eleven likes. So many people are lazy out there. Smash those likes right now and click the damn bell. Anyway, my question was if we understand that right now we can't really just arm all these countries with nukes, you know, just given the present situation, I don't think that's going to be really possible. What are the mm -hmm. realistic things that could be done purely given the choices we had? Because I know that when it comes to thinking that Russia is not going to go ahead and go into these other countries, these other countries seem to think so. I know, Aiden, you don't think so. But if that is a risk, then we could see, you know, bad things happening down the line as far as America's commitment, which is going to be a lot more than the small percentage of our defense budget. So realistically, what could we do in this situation to make all of this work? And uh, yeah, go ahead, Aiden. Like, how can we how can we solve this? Just given what we got, I I, I really don't know how we solve this. I I don't because I, as I said in my opening statement, but to, to reiterate, I think the things that are happening in Ukraine are sickening beyond belief. I I, I see the vote. I mean, Jesus Christ, Dylan, you must see it every day. The the horrifying images of of people being murdered in the most violent ways. And I, I'm not in favor of that, obviously. What I don't know what to do is, is how to ameliorate the situation. Russia obviously thinks that Ukraine is their sovereign clay, right? Um, I don't know how to change that. And I, I don't, I, I do think that part of the reason why that Russia thinks that is because of the Americans' involvement during the year of Maidan. True or false, doesn't matter. That's the perspective, right? That's the perception. That the I, United I do States... think whether it's true or false does kind of matter. Oh, I, I do think it matters in terms of actual reality. But what does it matter in terms of a war? I think doesn't matter. You mean Russia's perspective? Russian perspective doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's real or not. It's It doesn't matter if it's real or fake. The reality is that Russians think that America owns Ukraine, right? And that's what motivates them they think ukraine is a proxy state for america and whether or not that has any verisimilitude in reality at the end of the day when it comes to a war is actually inconsequential the reality is that this war is happening no matter what i wish that truth mattered but it doesn't appear to and it never really does in war does it because what really matters is emotions and feelings that motivate to go to war, which and to kill each other, which is horrifying. But I, I don't know how to end it. I don't know how to fix it. I wish I did, but I don't think there's any simple answer there. Uh, and again, uh, Dylan, I really, really appreciate what you've done um, in, in terms of being on the grounds in Ukraine. I know we disagree on some things, but um, I've really appreciated your perspective. And that will be the end of my statement, I suppose. <laughs> I All right, it. yeah. And Dylan, before we get to the uh, Super Chats, uh, what would be your take on where we go from here? What does the United States, in your opinion, have to do that maybe it hasn't been doing right now? So go for it. The floor is yours, my friend. So I hope I hope people can, whether or not, um, whatever position they have on whether we should be sending aid to Ukraine, obviously I think we should. I, th I hope people go and make sure that the history is properly documented in what is happening here. Um, I believe that history, um, uh, journalism is the first draft of history and that you want to have as good of a first draft as possible. Um, so I, I would ask people to not only support humanitarian organizations, um, but go look for yourself exactly what's going on on the ground here by checking independent reporters on the ground. I see a lot of crazy stuff online about the war is fake and, you know, it's, you know, all this stuff is just, all the aid is just getting like snorted into Zelensky's nose or whatever. But if you go look on the ground, I can see him like American. Uh, I can see American munitions being used out in the field. I just got back from Zaporozhia. We were with the counteroffensive filming uh, them using American M777 howitzers against Russian positions and how the, uh, this equipment is helping Ukrainians at the front. So it, my first just statement for a closing statement is please go do your own research. Uh, but please, when you do your own research, don't just scroll on Twitter and whatever comes into your algorithm is doing your own research. The algorithm is going to give you what pisses you off. The algorithm is going to give you what you want to see, whatever makes you interact with it the most. So 
diversify your sources. And uh, if you can, follow independent journalists. It doesn't need to be me. It could be other people as well. Um, but I hope you follow me. Uh, now, as for what we need to do, there's a question you asked earlier that I never really got to answer that I would like to answer in this question. And that is, what happens if, uh, if you know, Ukraine, if we were to stop aid and the war was to stop as it is right now, what would be the state of affairs? Because I see a lot of people proposing freezing the contact line or ending all aid. And I just I want to make clear when people are making this decision, what the results of that would be. And mm -hmm. I think first to do that, I want to say what aid has accomplished. What aid has accomplished yeah. is in, is enabling the Ukrainians to strike much deeper behind enemy lines to take out ammo depots and supplies and munitions, thermobaric munitions, artillery shells, which have been used against Ukrainian cities, which have been used against Ukrainian villages. And the destruction of these munitions does help defend lives. Same thing with the air defense. I've been in Kiev watching the the uh, the you know the patriot systems and air defense systems knock those drones out of the sky I remember once i was 30 minutes outside of kiev in the village house and one of those air defense uh systems knocked out a uh, oh. uh an iranian shahid drone about 50 meters from our back porch and oh it crashed God. very close to us oh but now it's headed towards the city and because it was shot down it didn't ram into a hospital it didn't ram into an apartment block it didn't ram into some civilian homes and so that as something that aid has contributed to over 50% of the territory that Russia has conquered in this war has been taken back, including the only mm -hmm. regional That's capital true. they've captured yep. in here at uh, They have been able to push the Russian artillery guns much further back and improve the counter-battery fire, making cities like Kharkiv, which used to be almost unlivable, mm -hmm. into places where I was able to go last time during my last visit and visit the zoo and see dolphins in the city and go and get ice cream and go out and see people returning to their homes. And that is the result of American aid. I see a lot of people talk about not contributing to the meat grinder, but a lot of people, and I think libertarians can appreciate this, strength is a demotivator to attack. Strength is something you can use to defend your home, defend your family, and to defend your country. And by pushing those Russian artillery guns back, Kharkiv is now a much safer city to live. And my friends there are getting bombed less. They're still getting bombed by the longer range rockets. But as the war has gone on, as the Russians have been pushed back from these major population centers, we've seen the amount of civilian casualties in this war drastically decrease. And so that is something that I think aid has contributed to. Now, what would happen if we were to let go of aid right now? Well, that means that a lot of areas like Metiopol, like Mariupol, and much of occupied territory would probably stay within Russian hands. And I think a lot of people, when they say we want peace... What that means to them, and I'm not saying that means Aiden, but I'm just saying about the general conversation going on in the West right now, is, okay, both armies have stopped firing at each other, at least temporarily, we've achieved peace, and then the rest of the world will move on. But what will probably go on, in my opinion, is that there will be some sort of resistance in the underground. There will be car bombings, there will be assassinations, there will be drive-bys of occupiers, of, mm. of you know, people who collaborate with the occupation, you know, uh, regional governors that uh, Russia installs, whether it be the head of the Crimean occupation, who's a mafioso, whether it be Dennis Michel, yeah. any of these people, um, that violence will continue. And I don't think anybody particularly says that the Troubles is a peaceful period in Irish history. <laughs> And so when we're talking about peace in Ukraine, yeah. we need to describe what exactly peace means. Because just because of the traditional two standing armies are not shooting each other doesn't mean that the terror campaign has ended. Doesn't mean that those mass graves aren't still being filled. We know that Vladimir Putin has signed an executive order last month making it so that if you don't accept Russian citizenship in occupied territory, give them a, a, a photo ID pictures of yourself. So we're talking, you know, you go to CVS, you take the, the passport photos giving those to them and your fingerprints. If you don't, they have the right to take away your property. They have the right to deport you. They have the right to arrest you. And everyone knows what goes on in these different occupation prisons. And so that is the taking away of people's most basic rights, their property rights, the rights to the homes that they've lived in for generations. And after they're deported, what's going to happen in that home? They're going to be replaced with a settler. This is colonial. This is settler colonialism. This is how it's done. You find some legalistic mm. way to be able to move people off their homes, find some bureaucratic uh, means to do it, or just sign an executive order that you can do it. There will be a mass exodus as people realize liberation isn't coming. There will be people who stay behind who will end up being put in prisons, tortured, and killed. The mass graves, which we have uncovered in Kupyansk, which saw over 440 re bodies recovered in one mass grave, with only 22 being military. It included men, women, and children. Many shot in the back of the head, 
hands tied behind their backs, bodies burned afterward in order to try to clean up the evidence. Same thing happened in Bucha. Same thing happened in Izium. Same thing happened in many different villages all across the country. Too many to name. Um, I've been to many of these mass grave sites and spoken to the survivors. Um, they seem to believe that they were treated in this way for a few reasons, not only due to the failures of the Russian army and the frustration of the soldiers who thought they were the second most powerful army of the world, but because of the ideology that was pumped into them. If you think that your enemies are the actual reincarnations of Adolf Hitler, then who doesn't want to murder Hitler? Who doesn't want to murder the Nazis? And so when you paint an entire population in that way, an entire nationality in that way, then that's how they're going to treat you. They're going to treat you like scum. They're going to treat you like garbage. And so I think libertarians have a better understanding of the state use of force than a lot of other people in their daily lives. And I think like this is something that I, I believe that they would be able to appreciate more than the average person on how valuable property rights are, mm -hmm. how valuable freedom of expression and all these things are. And this isn't a, a, a system of oppression that just started recently. I mean, once the Russians took over Crimea, they were taking Tatar Muslim activists yes, and, yes. and literally just dumping their bodies in the river. Yes, and their yes. bodies would be discovered by their families later, bloated, because that's how they, that's how they, oh, they just appeared in the river. They must have drowned. That's that's how the news will cover it. And that's just occupied, occupied territory. That's why when I talk to my friends about wanting to return home, like they will only return home when this territory is liberated because they can't live like that. And for many of them, those people, we're just talking about people in occupied territory. They'll never be able to return to my homes. I know people like my friend Bogdan. We just came back from Donetsk and he was able to see a city for the first time in nine years just from a distance. And it almost moved him to tears. He called his dad, showed him over the phone like, look, it's my home. It's my home. And the idea of him never being able to return back when just eight or nine years ago, that was somewhere he was able to live in and grow up in and enjoy his football and enjoy his, you know, beers with his buddies. He can't do that anymore unless that territory is liberated and will be legalizing the occupation that keeps him from his home. And lastly, what will happen to the territories of Ukraine that are still free? Well, on one hand, they'll stop sending their, their boys into the direct fighting that we're seeing in areas around Bakhmut and Zaporozhye, and so their deaths will stop. But once the conscription and, and the laws, uh, the martial law that is in place is lifted, we're going to see a max exodus of people from Ukraine if the territory is not liberated. Because yeah. many of them are going to understand. They yeah, just already happening. Them. Already happening. It is already. It has. A lot of people have already left the country. But once those martial law restrictions are gone, there's going to be a mass exodus of working class men leaving the country, which will cave out the economy. 80% of their shoreline is going to be occupied, meaning that the export of grain, one of their main exports, we're going to see the cost for the average farmer when it comes to transportation go up by 800 to 900 to 1,000 percent, making the wow. breadbasket of Europe unable to function as profitably as they were before. I mean, farmers are going to be really, really struggling if they're able to operate their businesses at a profit at all. They've been operating at a loss ever since the war started. And that's just talking about the farmers. You can go to any number of different economic issues on how 80% of their coastline and much of their coal mines and much of their industry, which is in the East, being bombed out and occupied, is going to economically destroy Ukraine. And what is that going to cause for the Ukrainians? It's going to cause political instability. They're going to see their jobs going away. They're going to see their grain, what their nation has been known for for hundreds of years, being not only their, their infrastructure for it targeted, which the Russians have targeted their grain infrastructure, pulling up their storage facilities, yes, yes. stuff to transport it onto ships, but they're going to see the idea of even getting that back erased from their minds. That's going to get them angry. That's going to probably get them on the streets. And it's not like the Ukrainian people have shown that they're not willing to go out and do direct action. And so there's a question of political instability, which, well, if there's political instability, the Russians have taken advantage of it before. What would stop them from taking advantage of it again once the inevitable happens, which is if you rob Ukraine of everything that gave the nation value, then, yeah, people are going to get angry. And then Russia will take advantage of the chaos. And I think there's a good chance they might invade again. And even if they don't, that political instability could cause a whole new wave of violence in Ukraine or a whole new wave of at least street violence and, and political and economic chaos. We're talking about setting Ukraine, if we freeze the line right now as it is, economically and politically into the dark ages for 40 to 50 to 60 years. And that's assuming that they can one day revisit this issue and try to get that land back. 
we're, per, we're going to legalize Ukraine becoming a rump state, which is what the Russians say happily that that is their goal, that that Ukraine, they're going to use Ukraine to make an example of what happens when you don't serve the Russian empire. And so when we talk about what happens if we freeze the contact lines now, a lot of people talk about this as like, we, well, I don't want to send the aid because I care about the Ukrainians. Listen to Ukrainian voices on this. I can understand someone saying, I don't want to pay that out of my taxes. I disagree with it. I understand it. I can understand someone having a self-interested or a national interest like we don't want to get entangled and stuff like that. But anybody trying to say that it's the humanitarian solution mm. to stop sending the aid, I feel like they're not looking at it from the Ukrainian perspective. Like those leftist hippies you were talking about earlier that were uh, the flower children left. The flower, the flower children, children exactly. left. Dylan, your 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 speech there, if you want to call it that, nearly brought me to tears. By the way, nearly. I am. Um, you got dolphin yeah. energy. You're wearing these aqua. You know, like it almost feels like there's going to be like an ocean that you're going to be swimming. Uh, no, I, it, it, and I'm not yeah. joking. I'm being completely sincere. That really brought me to tears because you're completely correct. But I, 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 again, the libertarian perspective, right, is to not look at things from the emotional and um, realistic on the ground perspective that you have, which you clearly have. And it's, it's damn you know for me like i i am like oh well like, who cares like you know a, a libertarian mindset kind of on stuff but you're you are right there and it did um you're you're right about how much the suffering is extreme and um i really sometimes i think that not just me but a lot of us don't think about that we don't see on the ground the real suffering that people are experiencing because we're removed. We're on the internet. Yeah. It's de-individuation effects. Of course we but, don't see but it. But what also happens what really people kill are, me yeah. is the thing is once this war is over, all the people that were calling for like, we need to stop sending aid for humanitarian reasons. They're going to forget Ukraine existed. Yeah, I, I, well, that's I, I for sure. Believe that. Yeah. Yeah. That's for sure. With all those uh, wine ants and wine moms. I think they also have the memory of a goldfish when it comes to what the current thing is, which is why I think yeah. this is way that beyond is being, a current thing but the thing is dylan like what you said it's all right and it's all true the only problem is that most people are not going to care and most people are not even going to be like those uh, hippie flower children leftists you were talking about most people are going to be all like well you know what america comes first we comes first what's in it for me why should i care and that's the only thing that i really can think that would solve this and this is where we may actually disagree is i don't think there's a lot of people out there like you dylan Meaning, I think that there are a lot more cowards than there <laughs> are no. people who are brave. And when I look at, for example, World War II, there were a lot of cowards before World War II yeah. started when Germany was going, you know, again with the justification of, you know, saving the native Germans that were being persecuted, yada, yada, yada. There were plenty of cowards that were alive during that time who had World War I fatigue. They didn't want a repeat of that uh, whole uh, struggle, and that's why they didn't do anything. This is why, like I said before, uh, Article 5, I hope you're right, Dylan. But I there's hope a little, you are right as there's well. A little part of me there's a little part of me that thinks people in high positions of power are going to be scared of the nukes and when push comes to shove they may decide to you know what let's not try anything you know potentially world ending we're just going to let him acquire like this little bit and that little bit and then china's going to be like hmm russia's doing not that bad why don't we then start going into taiwan and why don't we start aiding mm -hmm. russia more and then the whole the whole shit begins so that, to me, is where I see America's interests actually playing a much uh, bigger role here as opposed to just saying, well, these are horrible things that Russia's doing. I think America's interest does come down to the eventual expansion of Ukraine with uh, Russia. The, ex the event Hope, hope uh, Ukraine expands, but the eventual expansion of Russia with the help of China when it comes to territories that the United States has, not to mention Europe. And we're talking this being years in the making. We're not talking about this being like in a couple of months. But that is, I think, something that the Americans, if they see the potential for that happening, would understand why it's kind of important to choke Hitler out in the crib before Hitler starts to, you know, grow up into a uh, into a big boy. Yeah. Uh, it, it, to put a um, cap on this debate, I would say, Dylan, you have mm -hmm. moved me towards your position. Um, Happy to maybe hear more, maybe more emotionally than than than, than logically. But I, 
Yikes, dude. Like, you're completely correct. And I knew this would happen because I knew you had been in Ukraine and you were someone who's actually on the ground dealing with this and, and seeing it in, from a first person perspective. I, I don't like the term debate at all, by the way. Mm -hmm. I, I don't like debates. <laughs> I thought you were, you were responding to my tweets and you were like, you were asking me like if this is gonna be like a Dunkaroos contest. Yeah, right? that's right. I didn't want. I didn't want to be that. And that's why. Yeah, I respond to your tweets that way because I'm like, I don't want this to be like a. Like, don't treat me like a cartoon character. Is I think is what I said mm -hmm. because uh, that's what I was worried about because that's been a lot of my experience with. with well, all, all, well, all I saw was like I was like here's a cartoon. All I saw was this cartoon character. I was like, okay, I'm debating yeah. a cartoon and they're a libertarian <laughs> monarchist. Okay, got you. This is yeah, got it. Got it. Got it. However, I think this has been. I, in my opinion, very um, uh, helpful because, mm. uh, I, and that's why I, I was really excited actually to talk to you, Dylan, because again, you've been there on the ground in a way that I certainly have not. And, and I, I do have, I have had very public opinions on the Ukraine, Russia uh, debate, uh, controversy, war, et cetera. But I think this was very, very, um, this was very helpful. And thank you, Lev, for for hosting it because I thought this was this is awesome. And thank you so much, Dylan, for talking to me because I, I happy to talk to you. It's it's you extremely important. You gave me things to think to about. This. You gave me a yeah. lot of things to think about. Yeah. Thank this you. is the kind of crossovers that have to be done because, like you said, Dylan, looking at Aiden, seeing that weird cartoon character, you know, <laughs> sipping wine, it's like, what's going on here? So I'm finally glad that these different corners of the internet are merging together into the great Chris Chan dimensional merge. But anyway, before we go, super chats, including one fifty dollar super chat. Thank you so much, Jeremy Duke, for the fifty dollar. But before that, we got Animation Unlimited, ISK one thousand five hundred, which is uh, Iceland bucks. Icelandic yeah. bucks equivalent to, uh, I believe, $10. Thank um, you very he, much. He's a lunatic yeah. uh, stalker of mine, so don't take anything he says too seriously. All right, well, here we go. Dylan, uh, Dylan Byrne, all your articulate argument has been a total waste. According to Aiden uh, herself, your word is automatically superior just due to your XY chromosomes. What? A Aiden, explain this guy. What's, what's going on here? Uh, that guy is a stalker of mine. He's just kind of a lunatic. Don't worry about it. Yeah, well, like, he's really far away in really Iceland, so it. hopefully uh, he'll stay there. Yeah. Uh, Neptune. Well, however, yeah. I did just I did just agree that Dylan was correct. So I mean, maybe he's right. <laughs> and that was all because I was a man. <laughs> just because he's a man, right? Male privilege <laughs> wins again. Anyway, uh, Neptune, ten dollars. Victor Victor Shulkin was an ally of Zol Zolshevsky, Zolshevsky. head of head of Burisma. Zolshevsky. Yeah. Uh, Zolshevsky, head of Burisma, and was sabotaging both U UK and Ukraine investigations of Zolshevsky and Burisma for years, also taking bribes and extorting Zolshevsky's lawyers. He, he was, though. Uh, Zolshevsky was doing that. But but the fact that Burisma and Zolshevsky, who was the CEO at the time, um, was corrupt is not necessarily indicative of anything broader than that, I would say. I, well, I, th I think it's I think I lost the debate. So I think yeah. it's indicative of one thing that there is a legitimate reason for Shokin to be fired. Yes, absolutely, because Shokin was corrupt, and, and, and Slochevsky and the entirety of Burisma was corrupt. But uh, I, I think that uh, if, uh, I try to come to a conclusion here. Um, while we can agree that Burisma and, was corrupt, and while Shokin was corrupt. And while Ukraine largely was corrupt, it doesn't mean that absolutely everything involving Ukraine is also corrupt. And the final, Does that make sense? Does it work? Mm. I suppose. <laughs> and the final super chat of the night uh, from Jeremy Duke, fifty dollars super chat. By the way, if Ukraine falls to Russia, historians should acknowledge Ukraine's own corporate political corruption and accept its destruction as a mm -hmm. consequence. No government that disarms its citizens can represent its country. All right, any any final thoughts on that? I think a lot of people, when they talk about the nuclear question and Ukraine having nukes, they also don't understand that Ukraine in 2023 was not Ukraine in 1991 when the Soviet Union was falling apart. Um, its entire apparatus of state was collapsing. Um, the system that they had carried for about you know, 60, 70, 80 years was falling apart, uh, and economically, the country was in, uh, to put it lightly, the garbage can. And so them being able to even 
economically uphold the nuclear stockpile was actually a major question that the the uh, Ukrainian government was pondering when it was negotiating with the West on whether it wanted to give up its nuclear stockpile. And the combination of being able to have a decent relationship with the West, some sort of security guarantee from the United States and Russia, uh, even though the Russians didn't respect it, and the Ukrainians were oh, were very, yeah, and yeah, the Americans yeah. were very slow to respond to it in 2014. In fact, the Obama administration, in my opinion, abandoned Ukraine in 2014, mm -hmm. largely. Um, gave them very, very little to actually defend themselves uh, during the ATO. Um, uh, uh, but I, I disagree I think, there, but go ahead. Go ahead. I'm, okay, why would you disagree there? Because I think the Obama administration was deeply involved with Ukraine. I think I think Christopher Miller, he wrote a fantastic book um, recently oh, released. Yeah. It, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I read his book. He, it's very good. And he talks about how during 2014, the Ukrainian government, uh, yeah. Yatsenyuk went over yes. to them and he interviewed Yatsenyuk for the book. And it's a really good interview. I, I have read the book. To them, yeah. And he goes you... to the Obama administration. He's like, look, you signed this thing. You signed the Budapest memorandum saying you would up help us uphold our territorial integrity in this exact situation because we gave up our nukes. And the American government basically said, yeah, no, um, sucks. Okay. I mean, um, and then hang on, the hang on, hang Obama on. ever You're sent them was counter battery fire. Uh, was, that, was, uh, that, was that counter battery government. Hmm? Sorry, you're 100 percent correct about that. The United States government told Ukraine give up your nukes, and then you can become part of NATO. And then they gave up their nukes, and they weren't allowed to be part of they NATO. They didn't say That's, they didn't say that second part. They didn't say that they would become part of NATO. It was heavily NATO. implied, though, wasn't it? We all know that it was what, heavily implied. What, what, that what was the implication part, made? The implication was that you're going to become part of the international community if you give up your nukes. And it wasn't just made once; it was made like three well, or four Well, the international times. community is different than NATO, though, right? No, but NATO was part of it. It, it, it in fact, if you go I don't to... remember any implicit or anything being said uh, that yes, could have hinted at that. Uh, yeah, they said it. Uh, okay. Why would the Russians sign something that would say, "Hey, Ukraine's going to become part of NATO"? It was heavily implied. That Ukraine would be become part of NATO if they demilitarized. By that meaning, uh, denuclearizing, and they were not. Which is part of like, this whole situation is, is large part because that Ukraine was not made part of NATO even after they denuclearized, which they should have been. Honestly, the the NATO stuff I think happened later in around two thousand eight, two thousand nine, when they started really discussing NATO membership seriously. The the Budapest Memorandum was nineteen ninety four or ninety six. Yes, yes, it, which was with um. I can't remember anybody's name anymore, Clinton? but um, Clinton, Clinton, what, but also, yes, it was 1998, I think, when they first started talking, not, 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 not 1998, it was 93 when, they, it was when they first started talking about it, but, but they were supposed to be involved in in nato like they have been on the table to be involved in nato since the 90s and that they have not in my opinion that had nothing ukraine to do with the budapest be, memorandum the budapest Mem memorandum was a separate part but ukraine should have been part of nato since the 90s honestly in my opinion none of this wait, wait. Shit would have happened if you if, believe that ukraine should be part, should have been a part of nato yeah and that none of this would have happened if ukraine was part of nato well, I can agree with you on that. I don't think NATO should exist, but if NATO does exist, which it does, then Ukraine should have been part of NATO as of the 90s. In the parallel okay. universe of Aiden, uh, we would have recreational McNukes for every uh, separate I would love a, a recreational McNuke, personally. Well, I, can't, I do want to just say that, one, because oh, one this second. is something I talked about earlier about, about nuclear weapons. Having more points of failure, Love having you. everyone just race to get nukes, that's a very said. scary concept to me. No, I agree. Uh, more I know, of failure for nuclear weapons is very scary to me. I know it's scary, but a whole bunch of countries already have the nukes, yeah. so how are we going to roll but back But the more that? opportunities for failure, the more likely that there will be a failure with these nuclear weapons. Oh, I mean, America's lost nukes in bushes. We've, but we've North dropped Korea. them in the ocean. Yeah, I, I mean, don't like, want more North Korea's. North Korea yeah. doing yeah. missile tests off the shore of Japan is a bad thing, in my assessment. Well, I agree with you, actually. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, uh, like, that's again, fair. actually, weird, yeah. weirdly, weirdly, <laughs> even though, like, I, I don't know, uh, Dylan, what your your personal political perspective is, but I know it's left leaning. Yes. I think. Um, but I think we've agreed on like. 70 percent of issues involving Ukraine well, at the I, end of the day about the nukes, though. If because if you want to abolish NATO, mm -hmm. um, I do, and and the replacement for that would be everybody getting nukes. Uh, putting aside the gigantic costs that would bear upon these nations and all of that, 
just security wise, we both just agreed that having more North Koreas and more nations race to get nukes is dangerous. Wouldn't that be the ultimate outcome of abolishing mm. the collective defense that allows these countries to feel secure without Maybe. nuclear weapons? M Maybe. I'm not sure, though. I don't know. I, I don't know. I think okay. that having the the ultimate nuclear option is good right now. Maybe not forever and hopefully not forever. But at this moment in history, probably well. good. Well, the to, ultimate to the ultimate argument uh, that uh, somebody like Jason Giorgiani, for instance, gave on a previous uh, BTR stream is: imagine if we discovered zero point energy, and now all of a sudden, Hank Hill in his backyard would be able to have the Gosh, ability to destroy it. the entire world, you know, with the press of a button. I mean, that is something yeah. to think about, like just in general. How do we get humanity to the point where we all become more of a high trust society as opposed to a low trust society? But that's mm. an argument for a different uh, different day. But I definitely think that's something uh, worth considering in the grand scale. But anyway, guys, uh, before we go, any plugs? Aiden Paladin, what do you, what do you have uh, going on? I have a new video coming out that's about a very interesting scenario we're in. Oh, first of all, how much do I talk about this? Okay, I have a new video coming out, though, about like um, the uh, ethics of rating people's attractiveness online in academic publications because there was a study that was criticized for doing that. And we've all probably done it on some degree. You you rate like how attractive someone is on a scale from one to 10. I'm also now involved in a lawsuit. That's very fun with the uh, with Oregon State University because they uh, unethically and completely ridiculously removed my video that I made on a study that they published two months ago and they've tried to remove it oh, saying boy. that i did a privacy complaint uh, that i that i revealed private information about their scholars i did not um i have to call them every fucking day to be like can you please remove this shit it's ridiculous i've had to call here's the thing you forced my hand i've had to call the university i've had to call the funding source, which is the National Science Foundation, funded by the U.S. government, and the Journal of Applied Trans, the Bulletin of Applied Trans Studies. Well, they're all now investigating the... Re I just wanted to laugh at your study, and now it's going to get removed from your... It's Not, not only is the study going to get fucking retracted, but you're going to get all fired. Three of the five scholars have had their fucking profiles removed from their fucking public... Sorry, I'm so angry about this. I just, why would you do this? Just let me laugh at your stupid study. And now, no, no, now I have to go on a crusade. Thank you. I didn't want to. Just let me laugh at your study. Whatever. Anywho, so the fun, uh, new video, the fun new, never new video about, a new, about, about another bad study, kind of. Um, that's it. I shouldn't have that's done a, this. And uh, where, where can people, where can people, don't worry about it. Where can people find you? Aiden Paladin, A Y D I N P A L A D I N, at YouTube. If you want to see my videos, hopefully you can find my attack helicopter video soon. Absolutely. Oh, you got to color been... the hair on your uh, little avatar thing to be uh, to be blonde now, yeah, right? Like, I know, uh, I know. Yeah, oh, I know, I know. I just I've been yeah. I've been bleaching it white for six oh, and years, man. And before uh, before <laughs> Dylan Burns, uh, one final super chat from Dreadnought, five U.S. dollars. The U.S. didn't didn't imply that Ukraine would join NATO at the Budapest memorandum they actually promised they would never expand nato well here's the thing i don't think yep, they were yep, in a yep, position yep. to prop but i don't think they were in a position to promise it because that's something that has to be unilaterally agreed upon by the, the uh, members of nato you can't just like US throw that out and have that count i don't know dylan what do you think u.s promises whatever the fuck they want because we're in charge uh, aren't the, we the the promise to the promise is usually talked about um i believe is the gorbachev promise uh yes, referred about yes, when it was yes. expanding bases uh, into germany and it had to primarily do with expanding military bases in the east germany mm -hmm. what confuses me about the commitment which there's still a disagreement about whether it was made there's no official documented no, 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 like, no, no. agreement pretty clear that there was a conversation but it was about whether or not it applied to anything other than east germany 
Yes, that's exactly what I was about to say. Okay, the question sorry. is whether sorry. or not it was just expand, stopping expanding bases into East Germany or stopping the expansion of NATO more generally. The main mm -hmm. question, there's two things that, that I, makes me very skeptical of the claim. The first thing is Gorbachev himself has said that isn't the case, but he flips flops on it. Like he said drunk. It, yeah, Gorbachev, well, eh, you know, you can still say some pretty base things while drunk. Um, but the, the second <laughs> thing is, though, the, the second thing that confuses me is the Soviet Union wasn't even no longer a thing. And so I don't understand how they would be making these agreements in order to stop expansion of NATO into Soviet states when the Soviet Union was still a thing. And they were not expecting or at least not wanting the Soviet Union to fall apart. So negotiating that would be indicating that they were planning for the Soviet Union to fall apart. Um, I guess someone mm -hmm. could say maybe they saw the writing on the wall and they were doing but it's it's a bunch of question marks that I still have yet to get any decent answers to. Um, as for expanding into Ukraine, that was a question that really was not breached until the mid 2000s about expanding Ukraine into NATO. I believe it was 2008 when it was first like seriously suggested. It was the Georgians and the Ukrainians that both talked about NATO membership, um, which I think both considering their invasions, uh, Russia's invasions of them, they had decent reason to be asking those questions. True, true. All right, guys, uh, Dylan Burns, you are up next. Uh, what do you got going on? I mean, obviously, you're in Ukraine right now. You said you're going back home in November. Uh, any plans to go to New York City, by the way? <laughs> no plans to go to New York City, okay? Maybe you can start a war up there, and then I'll head up, okay? If you can do that for me. No, uh, um, well, certain things are brewing there uh, with the whole but, uh, migrant thing, but yeah. My my uh, my schedule right now is I'm going to be releasing a interview with a Brazilian international legion fighter on my main channel. Um, he's somebody who used to work for PMCs and then moved to Ukraine um, shortly after the Russian invasion in 2014. Got a wife and is now instead of fighting for money, is now fighting for his home. And it's a very interesting dynamic we examine uh, in this awesome. interview. Awesome, very cool. Um, the other thing that I just worked on is I just got back from the Zaporozhye counteroffensive. I was down there with. Ukrainian artillery crews about 10 miles from the Russians as they were bombarding those positions and talking about their jobs. We, I think we really documented what the front was like there. We probably documented uh, about 30 to 40 shellings that happened very close to us, you know, whistles flying overhead. And we wanted to document that to show the type of conditions that these people live under, as many of them have to live underground the majority of the day out of fear of one of these shells hitting them. The second day we filmed, we were able to film with the, uh, the, crew using Soviet artillery four miles from the Russians into the Donetsk blast. And uh, that day we concentrated mostly on the lives of the people, why they're fighting, what their family thinks of their work, um, uh, what they do in their free time. They play a lot of World of Tanks on Starlink while in, while in the dugout, apparently. <laughs> um, so I hope you guys look out for that video. We're talking, to, we're trying to send pitches to the Guardian and the Rolling Stones, but uh, no matter what, I want to publish all of this footage in some form of documentary format, and I'll be writing an article about it. Uh, I'm trying to think of a title. My working title for it right now is um, uh, uh, Deep Digits and Big Guns uh, is the working title for it, but we're still working on projects around this. But look out for that. It should come out near the end of this month. Nice, and, nice. And everybody, please go support the incredible work that Dylan is doing because, oh, my God, it's insane. Dylan, you. like you, you went and did it. Yeah. Everybody else like sit here on our computers and tippity tap, but you went and fucking did it. Yeah. So wait, why? It. That's I'm what very... I want to know. Why? Why did you do it? Why did you put your life <sighs> on the line? That, that's a complicated question. Um, you know, I think a lot of it uh, is ideological. I do mm -hmm. believe that Ukraine and. Uh, wants to have a functioning civil society and democracy the ukrainians are fed up with corruption and the and an occupying army in ukraine many of them being literal criminals taken out of prisons uh putting in mobsters in many instances to govern the country which has been done in crimea and all this other territory yeah. i think that's will be destructive for ukraine i think it's bad for europe to have that type of system expand out because it will continue to expand. Corruption festers and it grows and it crosses state borders. Um, uh, that's how a lot of corruption got into Ukraine in the first place. And so ideologically, I think the Ukrainians are fighting for something that is beautiful. I believe the promise of Euromaidan is beautiful. I also believe that the Ukrainians are engaged in a multi-generational struggle for liberation, as many other people were. 
Uh, and whether it's an American ally or not, the Algerians deserve to have their freedom. The Angolans deserve to have their freedom. The Vietnamese deserve to have their freedom. All the people of the world des uh, deserve and desire to have some sort of governance over themselves or, or desire for some sort of freedom. Now, how we perceive freedom is different across cultures and societies, but everybody calls for freedom. And for Ukrainians, that is a, a, a type of Cossack freedom that does not include the Russians. I believe that is something that's motivated me. Honestly, mm -hmm. part of it, some people talk about like thrill seeking. I don't know if that's really something that impacts me. I don't think it, 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 I identify it as impacting me, but it probably does to some extent being a young 20 something, you know, a sense of adventure. Are you that maybe. young homie? What the fuck? How young are you? Wow. <gasps> what? I turned 22 earlier this year. Yep. Wait. Oh my God. What? Well, uh, let me tell you this, Dylan. Um, you're incredibly intelligent. You're incredibly well um, versed on these things. And I, I'm not trying to, again, blow smoke up your ass, but I like smoke. <laughs> take, take it then. Yeah. Um, well, you've got the vape, you, you, Aiden, you've got the vape. So you could actually physically yeah. blow smoke up Dylan's ass right now. There you're, very, go. you're very intelligent. <laughs> you're very well informed and you are doing something that I think is so incredibly important to this world uh, in terms of uh, letting people know what's happening on the ground. And I think that your bravery cannot be overstated. I truly mean that. So like, I know we're having a debate or whatever mm -hmm. here, but I'm sorry. Uh, for the algorithm. I, I, debate for the algorithm. Yeah, debate for the algorithm. But I, I, <laughs> I appreciate I think, it. Well, I just wanted to let you know that I, I really appreciate what you are doing as well. And uh, I know that we're like probably on the different sides of the political spectrum, but I really nah, hate this like idea yeah. that like, oh, we have to be uh, attack each other all the time. No, um, that's not how I feel about it personally. Uh, and, and I think that you're, you're, you're doing some really amazing work and people, and if anyone watching this, go subscribe to Dylan's yes. Twitter and YouTube so that you can see the actual on the ground fucking stuff that he's doing in Ukraine. Cause it's mm. incredible. And important. how can, how can people support you monetarily? How can people give money to what you're doing, Dylan? Well, I want to comment on the, you know, we're different sides of the political mm. spectrum. Everyone should have a deep desire unless you're some sort of like manipulative authoritarian. <laughs> Everybody should have some deep desire in getting some, reference for the truth no one will have a true 100 understanding of the truth from the moment i choose the frame of what i am shooting in ukraine i have a bias that is being shown from when i choose the shot because i'm deciding that i believe this home being bombed is more important than me covering this grain crisis or more important than this but i still believe that one of the most important things when these wars are happening is to create a fantastic first draft of history and I think that's something that spans all political ideologies is to make sure that future generations, especially for Ukrainians who have a deep desire to make sure that their history is told, because uh, in many occasions it has been treaded upon by foreign occupiers. The Russians have dominated the world's view of Ukraine. Many people didn't even know Ukraine existed before this war. They just yeah, they yeah. thought it was like little Russia, basically. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that that is something that is important for all people, especially people who are living here. And so as long as people have an interest in that, I can work with them on that. Um, what was the thing you asked, Lev? How can people send you money, Dylan? That's the oh, most important thing. If people thing. want to support me financially, because um, this has been a big hit on me financially, to give up my panel show to do this instead. It costs money to buy mm -hmm. fixers. I have like body armor and helmets back there. That costs money. Um, having this little studio and renting it from Kiev, I got a good friend, got a good price on it, but... All of it costs money. And, you know, I, I got to pay for it somehow. If people want to donate, the best way to do it is to go to my website, DylanBurns.tv, and donate. If you do it on Twitch or YouTube, YouTube and Twitch are going to take a cut. And Jeff Bezos is great, but I'd like, you know, some better body armor instead of giving him a better yacht. Let's get, so, let's get Dylan some better body let's go. armor. Let's go. <laughs> so at DylanBurns.tv, that's the website you can donate. If not, I also have a Dylan Burns TV on Patreon, or you can sub on Twitch or YouTube as well. I'd greatly appreciate it. I appreciate it. Also, if you want to do charity work, UA Animals is a fantastic charity. Um, I was with them down in here, saw them. They're making uh, animal shelters in, really close to the front line, and a lot of these animals are getting abandoned. Many of them drowned in the Hirson flooding because uh, they were not the main priority. The environmental minister said about 20,000 were killed by the waterways. And these local charities that are based in Ukraine are very important to support because a lot of them, these charities are overseas. They're based in like Germany and the United States. And 
you don't know really where the money's going. With UA Animals, you do. And so if you want to contribute to a charity, instead of donating to me at DylanBurns.tv, UA Animals, I would ask you guys to go contribute to. They've got the pictures of the animals as well. There's like Mickey and Thomas the cat and Turtle the cat, yes, Yasuchka. Uh, the cat and a lot of dogs here too. So yeah, guys, well, check, check Lev, it out. You would know how to pronounce the names, wouldn't you? Uh, ho hopefully you, so. You, it's funny, like, Lev. You've been very quiet to much of this conversation, but you are someone who is from Eastern Europe. So... I was born in uh, Saint Petersburg. So you yeah. have a way more probably personal kind of information about a lot of this than than Dylan or I do in some ways. Uh... Uh, I mean, Dylan to... knows more than I do. Uh, I, I, I'm the idiot here, honestly. Um... No, but you are somebody who I think is very important, let's say, for certain things that may be in agreement with uh, Dylan's group. I think there's a lot of things that you could say that would uh, get people to think about certain things a different way. And same thing, vice versa. And that's why I do these streams, because I think that there is so much going on right now with this encircling of the wagons where people want their biases to be confirmed every time they tune into something yeah. and that's Which why it's especially yeah that's why it's true. very hard like there was a thing i saw with tucker carlson like on the right there's this whole thing about how uh you know tucker is like against the fake news and all that he took victoria newland's speech i don't know if you saw this dylan he took I her speech it. he cut the entire middle out and he said, like, the beginning and the end, making it say, oh, look at this crazy woman with her circular argument. And it's like, dude, you are no better than this fake news uh, media that you complain about. Yo, I, yo the yeah. Wasting Times, thank you for a $200 donation. They came out of nowhere. Thank you. I appreciate Whoa. it. That's Excellent. very big. And Jade Monkey, but that's $200. That's a lot of money. That's us Thank you. I appreciate it. I needed new ear protection. I can get that. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. I was out east with the with the artillery crews, and this is my ear protection. You just open your mouth so you don't shatter. Your no, teeth you gotta you gotta put little, little like um squeezy things in there. Yeah, yeah. But it's, I'm quite, you know I got I I'm 22 years my old. God, yeah, I do what health problems? My God, dude, you're so young. Yeah. You gotta protect your fucking shit. I. You're probably I, like the re the reincarnation of like some great uh, figure in history. No, I'm certain because I, it's like such a rare. I'm trying so hard not to be a, a big thing. gay about this, but like Dylan, <laughs> I really do appreciate. I, no one else is doing what you're doing. You're the only person in this YouTube sphere who has actually gone to Ukraine and shown what's happening on the ground. You're the only person. Well, no, uh, second person, the other person. If, if, People, I've asked yeah. about about yeah. it a bunch. I think a big motivation for it was I mean, people forget this because they hear how much I support Ukraine and people like imagine I'm like some hawk or something. Like no, I'm I don't just, think you, you are. Know, John Bolton Obviously, being cornered. we had this conversation. Um, we proved that uh, it's true. Some people think I'm the dove. grandson of the CIA director because we have the same last name. There's been a few mm. threads I've seen formed about that. But um, I used to work on the Gravel campaign, Mike Gravel. I used mm. to be. Mm. I worked on his uh, on his presidential campaign in Maryland. And uh, for me, are you like, from Maryland? Yeah, I was born and raised in Maryland, the best state in the union. Let's go. Were you born and raised in Maryland? No, I'm from West Virginia, but I lived in Baltimore for like 10 oh, years. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, then you're a scum with the rest of them, and we'll yeah, never right. accept you to our, <laughs> our perfect union. I'm a pan Maryland nationalist. Let's go. Wow. Yes. But um, what was I saying? Yeah. I completely lost it. All right, wait, before you regain it, I was saying the second person who also was on BTR who went to Ukraine, you definitely got to meet him. I want to introduce you guys together. It's Vladislav Davidson of the Atlanta Council, and he's frequently oh, on oh. with uh, Curtis Yarvin on BTR. They come in together and they uh, debate about Ukraine. So I would love for you Let's to uh, yeah, <laughs> to talk with That sounds like a fantastic time. Lev, you've yeah, got to get me on with Curtis. A big motivator for me, though. Yes. A big motivator for me was when I was on that campaign, I was not young and getting first inter interest in foreign policy. I hated the disconnect between the bureaucrat and the frontline soldier. I hated that disconnect about people in rooms looking at numbers on papers deciding who lives and dies. And that is what war is. And I understand mm -hmm. war is an extension of politics by different means. Von Clausewitz said that. He was right, yep. even if it's a cynical way to look at it. Mm -hmm. But I want to, if I was ever going to say we should send aid to X country to be involved in said war, I feel like there is a certain, a certain impetus on me to put my money where my mouth is. If I'm, I'm not going to say, 
for if I don't want to be the guy saying for American interests, let's send these foreigners off to die. Yeah. I want to go here and make sure that these people really are interested in fighting for their own liberation. But and that's what I found when I got when I came here. Ex but that's exactly why I respect you, man. Like you put your money, you put your life where your mouth was, and almost no one else has. Like I, I was talking about, like the, the people with the the um, glorified Jesus esque. Uh, yeah, when I got that tattooed, I, I right? came here to get it tattooed. But I mean, like, when I'm I'm here in like an mm -hmm. island off the coast of France, and there's people making like these holy Zelensky images. What? Why? Why are you doing that? And you have you have no idea what the fuck this entire conflict is about, but mm -hmm. you do, and you went and did it, and you actually went and fucking. Uh, made made a point, which is something that I can never say that I would ever do, um, and I think ninety nine point nine percent of us would never do. And for that reason, although we may disagree politically, I think Dylan, what you have done in terms of your um, true journalistic integrity is incomparable to basically anybody else. You you've done real good work. No Thank one you. else has done that. Sorry, I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to blow smoke up your ass, but <laughs> we disagree yeah, smoke, on some things. I enjoy the smoke. You know? Enjoy the yeah, smoke. <laughs> enjoy the smoke. But I, I, I'm really, really impressed. And I've always, because, like, you know, obviously, obviously, I have a different opinion. Mm -hmm. But I am um, not going to deny when somebody is doing really good work. So I really appreciate that. And thank you. I appreciate that. Well, maybe <laughs> in the you. uh, you're the, maybe... one, you're the one putting your neck yeah, on the line, yeah. man. Don't well, thank me. Well, maybe in the future stream, we could have like some discussion, uh, hopefully after uh, this uh, horrible war is uh, over, have mm -hmm. a discussion more about policies having to do with more left leaning versus right leaning policies. I think that'll be interesting. Uh, if uh, if you guys are up for it, and uh, Dylan, <laughs> Aiden, time. I would love for you guys to come back on BTR. Anytime. Yeah, I mean, maybe we could talk about my deep love of, you know, uh, Pol Potus thought, which, uh, you know, no one ever gets to talk about. Hell yeah. That would be a lot of fun. Mm. Uh, <laughs> we will call right, it, we will call it the uh, Pol Pot Hot Pot. Yeah. And it's going to be a yeah. combination of a stream and like, uh, what, what is it called? The Korean uh, uh, mukbang. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, Joe Biden is the reincarnation of Pol Pot. That's my radical belief. Bro, let's go. I, go I don't disagree. Um. Or, and However, with that, with, uh, with, with that uh, Aiden, how can people support you? After they support Dylan, how can they support you? I already said uh, Aiden Paladin, A Y D I N P A L A D A. Patreon. What's the Patreon? Do you have a Patreon? Same thing. A Y D I N P A L A D I N on Patreon if you want there to support me. Also, same thing on Subscribe Star. But I actually think you should go support Dylan because he's doing incredibly important work. All right, support Dylan that I'm first. I'm not doing. I'm it's, living in a, in a nah. nice little island, and not having. No, but you're, to, do, uh, you're doing very important. You're doing thing very, very important <laughs> involving work involving extreme war, where children are getting murdered. So, support Dylan. Don't support me. There you no, go. No, support Dylan. <laughs> okay, support Dylan first. Then, with the leftover, support Aiden, and then with the sure. leftover of that, with the leftover of that, support Break the Rules because Let's I think it's go. very, it's very important to bring all of you guys together because I'm tired of all this atomization that's been going on online, and this is the cure: being able to bring you guys in, being able to bring on the very online people together with more of the mainstream people, and we're doing it, and we're growing thanks to your help patreon.com slash break the rules become a patron today you're going to get mp3s of the episodes after this one comes out you are going to get instructions from me on how to create a podcast with the experience that i've gotten over the years here when you become a 50 dollar patron but there's like a you'll, you'll read about it on patreon uh, you'll know what to do there also listen i'm sure a lot of you guys here like discord who doesn't like discord right so you can join the break the rules discord with the link that i'm posting over here the link is also in the description go to the discord right now everybody also all the all the crazy people and um the other places that are being watched right now so um what's that place where you're streaming this dylan um you mean jeff bezos's fiefdom yes. also known as <laughs> 
Yes, to all the all the wonderful, wonderful Twitch people. I'm sure you guys like Discord. I posted the link. It's in the description of the YouTube video as well. So go there. And also, guys, subscribe to BreakTheRules.tv. That's the YouTube site. So if you guys are on Twitch, just type in BreakTheRules.tv. It's going to take you right to YouTube. Subscribe, hit the bell, click the like, all that good stuff. And leave a comment and share this video. And guys, support these amazing creators uh we will we will see you next time there's a lot of great content coming up all right till next time guys loveslens.com my sub stack Mwah. take care